It's nice to see you all back in person. It's been a few years. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Thank you for, for making the trip over. We are trying to do this, uh, a virtual version of this as well. So thank you for those who are attending via Zoom. I hope it goes well for you. We're, we're going to try to figure it out here. Um, before I start, I just want to say uh, many of you who have been here in the past probably noticed that the scene is a little later in the year. That means we have come in prior to 2020. Um, I believe, and we used to do it in early March. And so it's a little weaker now, a little closer to the season. And hopefully everyone uh, appreciates that. Um, it's, it's nice. It's not freezing to come when, when I walked in the news. And um, if, if you have feelings on when the summit is best, please let us know in the survey that's coming out um, after. So uh, welcome. So the 21st annual Thanksgiving Summit on Basic Aquatic Species. Um, I had to look at my notes to make sure I got the name right up and on the or as many of you know, it's going to be good. Um, the, uh, my name is, is Colin Holm, and I'm the Executive Director of Lakes Environment Association. Today we have a morning path of information on invasive species in the state of Maine and uh, what your cohorts and colleagues are doing to help prevent these species from spreading around uh, and getting into more of our waters. We have some special guests this morning uh, coming all the way down from Canada. Uh, Megan Bruce, who's a research scientist at the Canadian River Institute, part of University of New Brunswick. And Kristen Elton, who is a program director for New Brunswick Invasive Species Council. Uh, and when I say, the way down. Maybe it's just <laughs> um, in, Unfortunately, only miles from me, and I say unfortunately because uh, what they're here to talk about is zebra mussel, a zebra mussel infestation uh, found in Lake Temiskwata. Temiskwata. Lake Temiskwata. Um, in the St. John watershed right over our border. Uh, although it's a worrisome discovery, uh, I'm excited to hear what Kristen and Megan have to say about the infestation. Hopefully, we can learn um, from, from what they've discovered and help prevent this highly invasive species from spreading into Maine or uh, other parts of the U.S. or more parts of Canada. Uh, because as I'm sure you know, these, these species, along with all the invasives, don't uh, pay attention to any borders. Before I introduce uh, some new folks into the field, I want to recognize someone who has played an essential and fundamental part in uh, Maine's work to control invasive aquatic species for many, many years, um, and who recently retired from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, that person, who as I'm sure many of you know and work with over the years, is Karen Hamill um, from the Invasive Species Program. Karen is just a wonderful person um, and a true pleasure to work with, always calmly and thoughtfully approaching um, the task. Uh, she's going to be missed by many of you in the field. Uh, Karen is not here this morning. She is taking her retirement seriously. <laughs> and I'd still like to give her a round of applause. I know I'm Miss Karen from Scavengers, but invasive species uh, wait for no one. And uh, we're lucky to have some new, new folks, some new recruits joining, joining our fight. Uh, so I was recently told that it might not be a good practice to use military terms to describe uh, our work to control invasive aquatic species. And um, I'm really struggling with this despite my overall pacifism. Um, so uh, I'm going to try to reduce that terminology and see how it goes. But anyway, back to the new recruits who are going to help us fight. This is a really joined the main DEP to take over for Karen. And he has jumped right into action. He's going to be presenting later this morning. And I think many of you are going to be interested in what he's going to say. And may, uh, it may help you make your courtesy vault inspection programs more efficient and effective. Um, Chris, where are you here? 
Well, there he's already standing up and he's being pointed. So there's Chris. I know many of you know, but he's he's uh, welcome, welcome to our team. Heard nothing about. I've only worked with Chris a little bit, but um, Mary, who's worked with them much more extensively, has uh, said nothing but good things about you, Chris. And so I don't know why. I basically trust her. So welcome, welcome to the regiment. I mean, team. Can't <laughs> um, really wait next person because it'd be like introducing you to your best friend or your sibling. Um, but Tony PA has been at the summit since the beginning and has been a fantastic uh, speaker as well as a panelist um, because of her extensive experience uh, trying to control invasive aquatic species in the Belgrade and Cavasi areas. Um, and although she's been an advocate for prevention and control of invasive species uh, for across the state while working in the nonprofit sector, Nonprofit sector. Um, this spring, she joined May DEP and in the Invasive Species Program, and we're just going to turn it up a notch there. To Tony, I saw you earlier. There you are. Right. Please stay up. Come on, everybody. Um, I just learned this morning that um, uh, Blake Stewart's name is hired. Brett Willard, who is joining, I think, on Wednesday. Their team has. The new uh, invasive aquatic species person. So, uh, welcome, Brett. He has come. He's the past program director at a nature center in Camden, and very exciting to have a new uh, invasive species person at Alison. So, welcome, Brett. Um, and and uh, uh, lastly, at the end of May, Dakota Stankowski will join the main Department of Inland Fish and Wildlife new position, coordinating invasive aquatic species, focusing on fish and wildlife, but also supporting statewide uh, aquatic invasive species issues. She can't be here today, but it's wonderful to have a person in IFNW who can certainly be to help. Um, I also just want to take a minute to thank our partners at, at our Maine DEP and Lake Stewards of Maine who have craft today's agenda and corral and wrangle our speakers and panelists. Um, LEA, we, we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you, John, Denise, Chris, uh, Tony, and Christine. Thank you so much. It's a group that I heard that brought everyone here today. Needs to be right in Lastly, this is I think at least the second time we've said this. But most importantly, thank you all for coming today. Um, you and the many people who couldn't be here today, who are working on the front lines and behind the scenes to keep invasive species at bay in our state. Our 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 true um, true soldiers are you know worker bees <laughs> uh, in this fight. Um, invasive species are constantly pushing on us from the south, from the west, from the north now, from within our state, and it's going to or it's going to take consistency and persistence and continuing continued effort uh, to to win this fight. And and you the people are on the front lines. Thank you so much for it, for all the work you do. I know there's a lot of volunteer hours. There's a lot of passion in this room, and uh, it deserves recognition. So thank you. And I do want to give you all a round of applause. Thank you. Um, on that note, I'd like to introduce Megan Bruce and, uh, and Kristen Elton um, from the Canadian Rivers Institute and the Brunswick Invasive Species Council to talk about the recent and alarming finding of uh, zebra mussels less than 20 miles from the main border. What's that? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much uh, for having us and for um, yeah inviting us down here to chat with you about this issue that uh, we've kind of been expecting to happen at some point, um, but now is the time that we are having to deal with this. So my name is Kristen, um, and as was mentioned, I'm the program director for the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council, which is a, a nonprofit organization um, working just across your border uh, with various stakeholders to. Um, try and push invasive species management uh, in the province forward. Um, and we are currently playing a very large role in the coordination um, of the response to this, this impending issue. Um, to clarify, um, 
Lake Temiskwata is in Quebec, which is also just about 20 uh, kilometers. Miles. Miles. 20 miles. <laughs> Don't ask me what that is. Um, from from New Brunswick. So uh, this is that upper doorstep as well. Um, so we're very much in the same position as Maine, although Chinelli, you are upstream from this issue and we are downstream. So you do have a little bit of natural uh, uh, protection there and we'll get into that a little bit. So how we're gonna uh, kind of structure today is that I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of zebra mussels, zebra mussels 101. Um, and then uh, my colleague Meg Bruce is gonna come up and give you a little bit more information on the work we're doing uh, to conduct risk assessment. Um, and then I will follow up with a couple of our, our ongoing steps that are gonna be happening over the next year or two with different partners um, to, to inform the response. So we will just get started right away. Um, how many here have heard of zebra mussels and quagga mussels before? Okay, how many heard of quagga mussels? Yeah, okay, still a good number of hands. Um, so when we're talking about zebra mussels, um, it's just to note that a lot of the times people are talking about both species. There are two very, very similar species of freshwater mussel um, that uh, have invaded North America. Um, and a lot of the times when we're talking about zebra mussels, we're talking about both. There are some small differences, but just keep that in the back of your mind. I do have some photos here. So the zebra mussels on the left, um, Drysena polymorpha, um, and then quagga mussels is the Drysena fugensis, um, and those are the two that are in the Great Lakes that are moving through the U.S., um, and, but to, to the average person, when you're looking at them from far away, they're the same. So a little bit of background on zebra mussels. So, as I mentioned, they are a very small freshwater mussel. Uh, they're no bigger than your thumbnail at the biggest, but they, they can be quite, quite small, so size of a large grain of sand as well. Um, and they, I mentioned there's two different species. They are filter feeders, just like our native mussels, so that means that they're filtering in water constantly, taking whatever's in that water out of it, and then expelling the clean water, um, which will come into play in a little bit we chat about some of the impacts. They attach to surface by these little basal threads. So whereas our native mussels have a little foot that they can, you know, they can move around and, uh, but they're not actually stuck to things. Zebra and quagga mussels are more like marine mussels where they're actually attaching to solid surfaces with these sticky threads. So they will colonize on surfaces and they colonize in extremely high numbers. One of the estimates is up to 700,000 per square meter. Um, so, that is also one of the reasons why they become such an issue, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But you can see here the size difference. So these are a couple of native mussels. Um, and then this cluster is the cluster of zebra and quagga mussels. And then some, you've got some of the different individual sizes there. But basically, if you see a really, really small mussel that's stuck onto something, that's a red flag that you want to look at a lot closer. Um, they are native to the Ukraine and the Black and Caspian Sea. So um, they, they got here. We'll talk a little bit later about ballast water, I think, as well. Um, and then you can see also these little basal threads down at the bottom. So they, they're these really, really sticky, tiny threads. And that's, again, right, metric. Don't feel like I'm throwing this in your face. Um, two centimeters. So that's what? Just under an inch is about as big as they're going to get. All right. So how to identify them? Um, they're, they're, as I mentioned, very much small. They tend to be triangular. Zebra mussels. Um, have more of a triangular shape. And the interesting thing is they've got a very flat ventral side. So you can put a zebra mussel up on that side and it'll stay stand. That's one of the key indicators that you have a zebra mussel. Um, and then you can uh, see the shape there. They've also got, you know, where they get their name is these striations, these um, zebra stripes, but that's not the best way to identify them because sometimes they're from algae. If they're old, they've worn off. Um, and then you've got your quagga mussels. So they're a tiny bit bigger than zebra mussels, about the size of your thumb there. They're a little bit round. They won't stand up on their side to try and lay them. Uh, sorry. And I, I think they look a little bit more, they've got more like a comma shape. There's a little bit roundness to them. And they've got these dark concentric rings that grow out. So less of uh, striping. But again, the pattern really isn't the best thing to use, right? If you see a small muscle that's got little threads attached to something, colonizing in a big group, you just want to call somebody. Cool. All right. So biological characteristics. Some of this might be a little bit um, too detailed or not detailed enough for some people, but there are 
some key things about their biology and their habitat suitability that play into why they're such a problem and why they're hard to deal with. So um, the first thing, they do require a certain level of calcium. So because they colonize in such hard numbers, they do require a certain level of calcium in the water body to be able to form those shells. Um, so for quagga and usually the threshold is about 12 milligrams per liter of calcium. Um, and then for zebra mussels, it's about 12 to 15. Uh, optimal though is about 20 milligrams. So when it comes to deciding where your lakes are at risk, if you've got a lake that's really, really low calcium just naturally, it's probably not going to be as big of an issue for zebra mussels because if they show up there, they might not be able to thrive. But if you've got a lake that's really high in calcium, for example, the Great Lakes, um, you know, where it's all limestone based, that's just, there's tons of calcium there to help that population. Um, and then the pH as well also plays into it for, um, with my basic chemistry understanding from high school, pH affects calcium, there's a relationship there. Meg knows more about that, she'll talk about that a little bit. Um, you'll also notice that also going through these, there's less information on quagga mussels. And fun fact about that is because what we, they first were detected in the Great Lakes, it took about four years to actually figure out that there were two separate species. So a lot of this work at the background is on zebra mussels, and quagga mussels are kind of this little mystery that we kind of just assume is taking the same kind of path as zebra mussels. Another thing to consider, oops, oh, I'm sorry. Another thing to consider is uh, salinity, um, how much uh, salt in the water that they can withstand. So this plays into how far up our estuaries are, you know, are they able to withstand in those uh, tidal areas or not? Dissolved oxygen is another thing to consider. Um, and then the max depth, this is a really interesting one. So in the Great Lakes, uh, zebra mussels showed up first and their max depth in the, in the Great Lakes is about 120 meters, which is very deep. <laughs> um, but quagga mussels can actually go even deeper, deeper. They'll go deeper than 200 meters. So in the Great Lakes, where a zebra mussel can't colonize, a quagga mussel can. So they kind of like help each other out there and, and over everything they'll cover a lot. Um, the other interesting thing is that quag or zebra mussels tend to colonize at a peak density of uh, 20 to 50, I think that's million, no, oh, peak, sorry, this is depth. So their peak density is about 20 to 50 meters, which I believe is, that's like, what is that? That's 30 to 70 feet. Ish. So we're at 70 plus feet. Okay. Totally forgot where I was. Okay. Um, whereas the peak density for, for quagga mussels is in that 30 to 100 meters. So other things to consider are the temperature. Um, but interestingly, the substrate is also another thing. So zebra mussels prefer to attach to hard surfaces. So rocks, boats, inside of pipes. They'll attach to plants. They'll, uh, we've seen photos of them attached to like uh, dragonfly nymphs, like other species. Um, and there was actually one recent detection of a zebra mussel attached to a fish, side of a fish. So that's interesting. Um, but quagga mussels, they will, they will uh, colonize on hard and soft surfaces. So those mucky bottoms, those soft substrates, quagga mussels have those covered. So again, between these two species, pretty much everywhere is fair game. Um, another thing to consider is their spawning. They spawn at different temperature or at around 12 to 15 degrees Celsius for uh, zebra mussels. And then five to fifteen or five to seven degrees for quagga mussels. So quagga mussels again, that's why they're thriving in deeper uh, depths. They believe waters are cooler down there. Um, so this will have an uh, impact on the times that they're reproducing and can help you time your monitoring if you choose to do that. Which again, we'll talk a little bit later. Um, and then the other just interesting fact is that quagga mussels tend to have softer shells than the zebra mussels. So that means that. Um, zebra mussels aren't usually predated on by a lot of species. Um, the going theory is that they are so small, and there's such little meat in them, that it actually would take more energy for a fish or a duck or whatever to actually try and break up that zebra mussel to get than what they'd actually get out of it from eating it. So it would try to, it'd be like us trying to live on celery, right? Like we're spending more calories trying to actually eat it than we would be if we're getting it. 
uh, for nutrition from it. But quagga mussels have softer shells, so they think that they are more naturally predated on. Uh, a note on that point, um, the only thing that we know of that really seems to like zebra mussels are uh, gobies, which are also an invasive fish that have invaded the Great Lakes. We're not saying we want to introduce gobies. I just want to make sure that people understand that that is something that is, a, you know, going after the population. But that makes sense because gobies come from the same region as zebra mussels uh, in their natural range. Okay, so what does this colonization look like? Um, this. So as I mentioned, really, really high numbers. This is uh, our native beer can happening in the bottom of the rim. You can see the different sizes here. So these are some of the larger, uh, larger mussels. Um, the, the older ones, but all these tiny ones are mixed in there too. This is the zebra mussel growing on that dragonfly nymph I mentioned. We've got our uh, crayfish covered in zebra mussels. Um, this is the bottom on the bite, bottom right there of a buoy. So that looks just like dirt. Those are all baby zebra mussels. Um, and then in the top right, we've got that mucky soft bottom, and those are all quagga mussels that are covering that surface. So they will cover pretty much anything. And this becomes an issue for not just the environments that they're in, the ecosystems that they're in, but um, particularly for infrastructure. So biofouling boats, they will get into boats and uh, water intake systems. So into dams, into motors, um, into water treatment plants. Um, and once they start colonizing those numbers, they start clogging them, they start impacting that function. And then the costs come along with that when you're trying to maintain it keeping those systems clean so that you can you know, maintain your infrastructure. So why, why are they able to get into all these places? Uh, are, you, know, you don't see native mussels hanging out inside boat motors or inside dams. And the reason why, it has to do with their life cycle. So who here knows anything about the freshwater mussel life cycle? Don't worry, I did not either until I started this job. So native mussels require a host species, uh, host fish species. So when they reproduce, um, they uh, male and female put their uh, sperm and eggs into the uh, water column, they meet up, and then those uh, glochidia, the tiny little larva stage of those mussels, have to attach to a certain species of fish. They attach to the gills. And they hang out there until they're big enough to fall off. And then wherever that fish happens to be when they fall off is those mussels look down. <laughs> they're not traveling far distances. Um, also to note that the fish is not harmed in that process. Now, that means that our native mussels have a limited range of where they can live, right? It's dependent on where that fish goes. For zebra and quagga mussels, they do not require a host fish. Their larval stage, which we call the villagers, are free floating in the water column. So male and female put out their eggs and sperm, they meet up, and then those villagers just hang out in the water column for up to three weeks, just floating around until they are large enough that they settle out and then call it like attach to the hard surface that they want. And then where they attach, they just don't really move out. So that means because they're just free floating in the water, they can go anywhere water will go. So naturally they'll spread downstream with flows. They will get sucked into your boat motor when you're at jet ski, they will go into dams, into water treatment plants. Um, and if they happen to be large enough and attached to those surfaces, that's where you're getting this colonization starting and accumulating in this, uh, uh, in, into the infrastructure. So you can see a couple of photos here. This is uh, on the back of the boat motor that's all covered in zebra mussels. Um, how they originally showed up, and I know somebody's going to chat about this a little bit later, is through the ballast tanks. That's the going theory. So cargo ships would have been in Europe, Eastern uh, Europe, Black Caspian Seas. They would have brought on cargo to balance out the ship. They bring on water in those ballast tanks to balance it out. They take their trip across the Atlantic to unload their stuff in the Great Lakes. They don't need that water anymore, so they dump it into the Great Lakes. Anything in that water is now being dumped into the Great Lakes. So they've gotten a nice free ride all the way across the Atlantic. Um, and this is how quite a few different things have come to North America. Zebra mussels, um, green crab, things about tunicates is also considered as well. So fortunately, um, at least in Canadian shipping laws, I think it's under an international thing now, there's new regulations that require ships to exchange their ballast water out at sea so that anything that is in the fresh water gets dumped into salt water and won't survive. And then anything that's in the salt water that comes into the boat won't survive once it gets fresh water. 
Um, this was one of those hindsight 2020 and learn from that mistake. But the issue is, is that once things arrive in North America, that's our primary vector getting here from their native or their natural uh, habitat. Then they start to spread out by other means, recreational boats. Because we don't have massive shipping um, boats going from, you know, up and down our rivers or with ballast tanks. We have recreational boats. We've got natural river flows, that kind of thing. Um, and they've done studies to look at how long can zebra mussels live outside or in these ballast tanks when they're on boats. So in ballast water, it's about 11 to 15 days. And then interestingly, you can have zebra mussels on a boat or a trailer. And if it's humid enough, you can get 13 to 18 days of survival if it happens to rain and it's right. So um, when we talk about clean, drain, dry, it's those three steps for making sure you're not accidentally moving things. This is where the dry part is in, because you want to make sure that if you miss anything when you're cleaning it or when you're draining it, you're at least drying it or really letting it get nice and crisp before you put it in the water so that anything you missed isn't viable once it comes back in. The other interesting thing I want to point out here is this top picture on the right. I grabbed this photo when I first put this presentation together to show that they attach to plants as well. That's a consideration about a real foil for anybody, anybody paying super close attention. Um, so this is a two for one. And unfortunately, um, zebra mussels do attach the, the, because of the kind of clumping and the nature of how easily um, Eurasian water milfoil and plant matter can be picked up by boats and moved around. And because of how small zebra mussels can be, very often you're getting this kind of transport where there's more than one species that you're bringing along. All right, so for those of you wondering where the heck are they, um, I forget one of my... I think I'm going to just put on that. Okay, so this is a map uh, current to February of where all the zebra mussels and quagga mussels have been faked and where they've been um, introduced but eradicated and then also introduced but failed. So these ones that are squares are these, the orange squares are the ones where they have showed up and they failed to establish, probably because the calcium was too low. So they got there, but then the population died off because the habitat was but the one thing I want to point out is where zebra mussels first um, showed up was in the Great Lakes, Lake St. Clair, smack in the middle of that cluster. Um, and you can see all these different kind of the, the lines kind of that form from all these dots right around here. So that's natural spread. You're not going to do anything about that because that's water moving downstream and those zebra mussels are just along for the ride. What we do see are these random hops and jumps, right? Zebra mussels didn't get there by themselves. They didn't fly. That is obviously a recreational boat or a piece of equipment that has been in an infested area, driven to where they're going, put in a new water body, and then the, and they've been given a free ride there. Um, just a little bit, quick overview of that history. So they uh, did spread throughout Europe. They were a problem in Europe before they got to North America. Um, they believe to have gotten to the Great Lakes system, as I mentioned, by the uh, hitching ride at ballast water. Um, and the, this were first identified in uh, Lake St. Clair, which is between Lake Mich no, yeah, Michigan and Erie uh, in 1986. Um, they figured out quagga mussels were there as well in Lake Erie in 1989. And then by 1990, they were detected throughout the entire Great Lakes Basin. They've been spreading to inland lakes. They were detected. Uh, they spread to the Red River Basin in um, Wisconsin. Yeah, no, Wisconsin. Um, in 20, 2009, and then they were found in Lake Winnipeg in 2013, which is actually where that Red River Basin drains into. And then, unfortunately, as was mentioned, back in September, they were discovered in Lake Tumsquata in Quebec. Um, I do have this little animated map I just want to show you. Um, so you can see over time, oh, sorry. Change my view. We'll see about finding that after. Maybe somebody can help me change the view. But I'll show you this animated map at a later time that shows you the, the timing of it. So um, they were discovered in Lake Timbersquata, which is right up here, just across the border. So here's the uh, blue line is the US Canadian border. This black dotted line, that's the New Brunswick Quebec border, and Lake Temesquata is just up there. So the very top of the St. John Wolstick watershed. 
Um, I always say, you know, we do want them anywhere to show up, but it would have been nice if they showed up down here at the bottom, then the rest of it wouldn't have messed up. Uh, but no, they're at the very top. And um, just for those, we've got, this is the Madawaska that drains down from Lake Temesquata. It meets St. John Willowstone River in Edmonston, and then it flows down this way. Um, the rest of the St. John River coming from Maine comes up, runs along the border, and comes down. So you are upstream, so you're protected from that natural flow. What you're not protected from is the boats that are moving throughout this region. All right. You mustn't panic. Um, and now I'm going to pass it to Meg, and Meg is going to chat a little bit about some of the next steps we uh, have. All right, so we're just going to try and bring up that last map. So I'll talk for a second while we're bringing up that map. Uh, I'm Meg, I work with the Community Rivers Institute at the University of New Brunswick. I'm a research scientist there, and I have been contacted by Mr. McCary, uh, but I also work on Eurasian water milfoil and toxin producing cyanobacteria if you want to have those conversations today. Uh, so that's the way I put it in the app at the top. All right, so here's the map. Yeah, you can use the microphone. Oh. Let's uh, first just look at this map that. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. So here is a time lapse map. Um, you can see the different evolution of these these dots showing up. Um, just to give you a better sense of where they are in in the U.S. as well. So you do not have them in Maine. The closest uh, detection up until now has also been in Quebec, just southwest of Montreal, um, in and in New York, uh, New York or yeah. Okay, thank you. So, for instance, there are also zebra mussels in Vermont and uh, Lake Bombazine and some of the main audience in Vermont. Okay, so let's Okay, so this is where we left off. This is where introduction was just north of New Brunswick in Quebec. So in light of this near hotter fire, it is now time for us to carry out a risk assessment. And that's where I come in. Um, I was contracted by Kristen to carry out a risk assessment. Uh, and part of that reason is because the Canadian Rivers Institute has long-term um, ecological studies on the St. John Willowstone River and extensive environmental data collection and collaborations with other groups. So we were sort of the central point for pulling together this information. And in light of this threat, we identified three critical actions at this point. The first is knowing what we know about zebra mussels and wagon mussels, and knowing the current location. It is now time to increase awareness of this threat and promote stewardship activities in our problems that mitigate this threat. A second um, action item is to carry out a risk assessment. One of the goals of our risk assessment is to identify priorities for biomonitoring and then be able to advise our third action item, which is figure out who does what when we find it. That's one of the hardest things that I encounter when working with different groups on invasive species, as I do extensive training with different organizations for identifying invasive species. And I always get asked the question, who does what? And admittedly, our province is very behind on this because we haven't had to deal with a lot of invasive species yet. So it's a new challenge that uh, we're trying to figure out how to navigate. So we're watching you guys. Um, and in our risk assessment, we actually had a in a model that was published by the EPA for ecological risk assessment. And I say adapted because we also included in our risk assessment environmental risks, introduction risks, and socioeconomic risks. So this is the first general overview of trying to get a picture of the challenges that we face. So this risk assessment starts with the first step of problem formulation. Well, we know what the problem is. Zebra mussels are right on our border and connected to our watershed. We carried out a workshop in March to analyze the exposure and effects. So what this means in terms of our risk assessment, exposure is what are the chances of new introductions, new hops to either other water bodies or downstream spread via vectors. 
And our effects are um, what are the environmental, ecological, and socioeconomic consequences of when we get these new introductions. So at this workshop in March, we rallied the troops to collect this data. We had 92 different organizations invited, 60 of them were able to participate because like you guys, we have a ton of different watershed groups and lake associations that are each doing biomonitoring and they know their systems best. So when we got in a room, we were gathering data, so it was a working workshop where we gathered data to build maps and identified areas of populations of air species that may be impacted by the threats of new introductions vectors. So we're having our fishing tournaments and having um, most significant um, jumps of new boats coming in and rec pious recreational activity. And this is where we are in the process, risk characterization. So based on all of this information that we gathered from our groups, what was it telling us about how we're going to be able to navigate these challenges? So our risk assessment, because we don't have the one convenient data set that tells us everything we need to know about every water, every water body, was based on an expert knowledge approach. So the expert knowledge approach, the experts are the leaders of the groups that we work with that provided the information shock. But we also have another stream of information, that's the analysis of available environmental habitat data. Because of course, the questions are, with new introductions, what are the chances that the organism is going to survive based on the available habitat? Are the environmental conditions conducive to invasion? And if it does invade, then how is it getting to new places and what's going to happen in the, those places? So here's our brief habitat analysis based on the calcium metric that Kristen um, mentioned. There are certain levels of calcium required in the water that are deemed sufficient for invasion, successful invasion following introduction. And a lot of New Brunswick is calcareous limestone. So you can see here, here is our St. John or Woolstock River watershed. These are our main tributaries. The uh, Washington, the Blind, the Kenwood Cases. And all of those red points indicate data points where there's optimum calcium levels for a patient. Anything that is green or yellow is also considered blue, so it's still feasible. And of course, there's a lot of data deficient points. And just because calcium levels are low at some of these points doesn't mean that they're always that low because, as you know, water quality changes. Uh, day to day, especially in slowing environments and uh, throughout seasons. So, at our workshop, when we asked what the threat of introduction is spread, we asked our participants what areas you know of where there are activities occurring that could present a risk of introduction. We gathered all of that information. We're now building the maps. We're working on the habitat maps that I just showed. And then, what are the impacts? So, we had industry representatives, municipalities, Helping us map out where our infrastructure is. We had researchers helping us map out um, species distributions to be able to compare those impacts. So then what we're doing is we're going to overlay those maps and ask the question, where are the areas where the zebra aquatic crossings are most likely to be introduced and can survive to colonize? And where do these overlap with our either environmental and ecological or socio and economic um, for us. So the first thing that's coming out of this, which we'll see in our report in about a week, is the this information we collected. When we interpret that, we're going to see these overlap areas, and those are how we're going to identify our priorities for biomonitoring. And of course, that also helps us identify what groups are where in these high-risk areas that we can reach out to to mobilize. Those are the groups that are going to need support from biomonitoring, and those are the ones we're going to need active communication with to know what it is they're finding. And last but not least, in our risk assessment report, we're coming out with recommendations for how to monitor, because the goal is to have everybody aware of the tools for how they can look for zebra and quiet muscles, because early detection is optimal. And um, what to do, how to sample, how to submit samples, instructions for reporting. Who do they tell if they find something? And last but not least, we're going to start, start the discussion for roles and expected actions of regulators, non-governmental organizations, 
Joint smaller groups, research, and other stakeholders. So, because we're a bit behind in our actions, management of invasive species, we need to have this conversation. I am not a regulator, or as Kristen, so we cannot tell groups what actions they can engage in to um, uh, combat these invasive species as they find them. But we are trying to prepare regulators through feeding them the information of um, what our priorities need to be to be able to advise. They have a little bit of time. We haven't found them in our province yet, but this is how we're trying to drive these conversations so we know what to do, what we do finally. Okay, so just to return to our critical actions, uh, our risk assessment, the second one here is working to support our in this risk assessment, we had extensive stakeholders to increase awareness of this. When by identifying our priorities, you file them, we're going to be able to know who it is that we need to prepare based on who is at the greatest threat, who will get that training, and then all of this information will be shared with our regulators as we have the discussion who does what. And back to Chris. All right, so I will also add the caveat that we haven't found them in New Brunswick. Nobody's looked yet. That's the problem. Um, so who here has heard the term EDRR, early detection and rapid response? Well, hands. All right, awesome. So keeping a coordinated set of actions to find and eradicate potential threats in a specific location, they spread and cause harm. This is early detection and rapid response, not early detection and, oh, um, I'm not really sure what we should be doing. Who should be doing that? Oh, I don't know. It's been 50 years and the problem is now out of control. That is not the model we want to go for. We want the rapid response. So um, some of you might have seen this. This is the invasion curve. This is a timeline. The um, time comes by, the amount of area occupied. Also keep in mind that as the area occupied corresponds also with the amount of resources it takes to deal with. So at the beginning, this is kind of the general curve for any invasive species invasion. It's a pretty adaptable model. So at point zero zero, the species shows up. Um, before that point, you can prevent it. And it's pretty low resources if you're just doing prevention. When something is introduced, um, what happens is if nobody's looking for it, the species continues to grow and spread. The amount of area increases, and so do the resources that take to control it. So it keeps going. And normally, once it's detected, if you can get on it really quickly, again, you can deal with the issue, fewer resources. But if nothing is done, you quickly get into this exponential growth where eventually you get into the point where you're really not going to be able to eradicate the problem. You're just going to deal with the, the consequences or manage the impacts. Um, so there is also a very interesting economic return, and in, um, if anybody is a, an economist who wants to get into that, the numbers are there. What we're trying to do with early detection and rapid response is basically chop this left or this right part of the graph off. We want to detect it as early as possible. We want to have our plans in place ahead of time so that we can respond to things when the population is down here, not when it is all the way up here. So trying to do in New Brunswick. We've got a couple plans in place, um, and we're working with quite a few different partners across the region. What is our outreach? Community outreach and the main kind of staple program is our Clean Drain Dry Awareness Program, which um, I know you guys have something similar uh, in, in Maine as well. So we're doing awareness, um, doing a survey to detect in regions, do people have a basic understanding of zebra mussels? Do people know what they are and they just need to know how to deal with them? Do we need to start from scratch and say, this is what a zebra mussel is, this is how it's going to impact you? So we're working with uh, partners um, in, in northern New Brunswick to determine what that level of awareness is within the public so we know how to cater our messaging and where to direct it. We're putting in launch signage. This is an example here, one of the smaller signs that tells people this is where you need to be clean, drain, drying. Um, doing public events, that kind of thing, and targeted outreach with um, different industries who may come across zebra mussels. So, for example, boat mechanics. Um, another interesting one that came up recently, somebody pointed out that we have a lot of people selling their expensive houses in Ontario and moving out east. Um, and some people are bringing their boats and their docks with them because it's cheaper to move your dock than it is to buy a new one in the maritimes. Um, if, you know, 
the material has zebra mussels in it. So if you're moving a dock that's been in that water, um, it's not in the winter, so they might have frozen. That sense. So you could literally just be plopping a population of zebra mussels in. So reaching out to realtors and saying this is something that has to be on your radar if you're selling the property on a lake to somebody coming from out of province. When it comes to the monitoring and the training and reporting. So as Megan said, we're working to identify priority sites for monitoring based on this risk assessment. And we're gonna be establishing a network with partners. So I'm not the one who's gonna be going out and collecting the water samples. I'm going to work with my watershed partners, government partners who are already out there doing water quality sampling, who are more familiar with their water bodies. Samples, and I'm going to pay them to do that if they need help, and I'm going to cover the cost. Of me, I mean, an organization is going to cover the cost of that analysis, and we're going to be doing ED analysis in these key places that we have highlighted. So next year, um, we have uh, anticipated identifying 10 to 15 sites, and then doing a pilot with two to three this summer. Then these muscles were detected in temp squats. We kind of have to rejig things, so we might be doing more sites. So we're going to be doing EDM and sampling. We're also going to be coordinating distribution of collector plates um, to different organizations, to municipalities, and to citizen or community scientists, so people who have docks. These plates, literally, um, you can make them yourselves. You can buy them. They just hang under a surface. You can put some of them straight on the bottom as well, and you treat them once or twice a season. Are there fever muscles starting to collect there? So that is a kind of a form of community science that we're looking to have more eyes on the water. And then we're also going to be working with groups who are out already doing um, freshwater surveys uh, for native mussels or species at risk, or if they're doing fish surveys, to get them trained. Of if you're already out there doing something, here's another small thing you can add on to be looking for, because I don't have the time to be out on every single water body. And then we're going to be doing training and reporting. So um, working with these watershed groups, research students, everything, anybody who's out on the water to train them about what zebra mussels look like, how to report them, how to collect them. Um, and then we're also currently starting to work with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which is our national um, body, um, regulator body for aquatics, um, and our provincial Department of Natural Resources Energy Development um, on developing response plans for. Um, I'll say when, because it's a matter of when, not if, when zebra mussels are detected further down the river or in a new water body. Because as Meg was saying, we want to know in advance who's going to do what has to happen. And that needs to be sorted out so that we're not wasting time trying to do that once the detection has come in. So that is what we're working on right now. Um, we, unfortunately, as Mason, are also very behind New Brunswick when it comes to our legislation. We do not have legislation that tells us we need to pull the plugs in our boat. We can ask people to, but do they follow? No. We don't have voter legislation at all. So that makes it hard to even put that in place. We don't have any rules about you can't move invasive species. So we're really, we're, we're limited in what we can do. It's going to be focused on outreach. It's going to be focused on quick response. Um, and a big piece of this is just working with our partners. Um, so I want to mention a couple of the different groups. Some of you may have already been in touch with this. I said earlier that this, when this detection came about, it was like the start of a horse race. The gun went off. A bunch of horses just ran in different directions. Some of them stayed frozen in one place because they had no idea what to do. That's kind of what's happening right now. And we're trying to fix it. Um, but we're trying to get that coordinated response so that what people are doing isn't duplicating other people's efforts. So we don't have three people monitoring the same spot. It's also consistent so that we're getting the best bang for our buck. Um, so we've got the ourselves, the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council, the Canadian Rivers Institute that Meg is with, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans at the federal level, various New Brunswick governments, um, and then some other partners, particularly in the northern part of the province and in Quebec, where this issue is front and center. There's the uh, Organisme du Bassin des Sons de Flux Saint Jean, which is the um, the St. John Watershed Association in the part of Quebec. Um, and that is where the actual Lake Temesquata is, is located. There's also the Society uh, de Management de la Riviera Manawaska, which is the Manawaska River Association. They're the river that is uh, the Mat uh, Temesquata drains into, and then that drains into um, our St. John River. Northwest Regional Commission um, and CARNO, which is another management association up in that region. So these are all generally nonprofit, um, the watershed groups who are working or applying for different grants. We're trying to move forward with um, putting 
working groups together in place. So if you are an association that is up in that area or anywhere that drains along the St. John watershed, we'd be looking to get in touch with you because we want to bring all these stakeholders together to keep everybody on the same page. I don't care that there's more. Um, all right, so thank you. I know we ran a little bit over time, but we are available for questions at any time. Get in touch with us and thank you again so much for having us and good luck. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you. Um, Lou, thank you for taking a couple of questions. Oh, sure. um, you know, and that, we'll just bump everything a little bit forward. Um, in the back, in blue. Yes, what's being done to stop the, uh, the transport of these boats coming across the border? The question is what's being done to stop the transport of these mussels across the border? Well, the boats bring the boats. The boats bring mussels. Um, I don't think you're going to like this answer, but I don't think anything, honestly. Um, the, from my understanding, there are boat wash station and decontamination units in Maine. I think that I'm hoping somebody can know. Um, yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing that prohibits a boat coming across. Um, as I was saying, a lot of this, first of all, it's detecting the muscles on the boat, which is very hard because sometimes they're inside these components. Of the boat that you can't see, you're not, you know, actually opening up the engine. That's why I've been advocating for detection dogs in every single jurisdiction. Um, but it, it really just comes down to public awareness. There's nothing um, in some states and jurisdictions. There are rules that you are not allowed to transport zebra mussels, or and you are required to clean drain drive. That is not the case in New Brunswick or Maine. So to add to that, you mentioned Kristen that municipalities were looking at bringing bylaws for any boats coming into their uh, use our public launches. So um, there are gaps in action from uh, a legal perspective of legislation, uh, but groups uh, through recognizing the importance of this issue are mobilizing and doing everything that they can. We did uh, we did have conversations um, with some folks about key events. So I've been told there's a big muskie fishing tournament somewhere up in the in Maine, where a lot of people from Canada come from. So identifying those types of events is good because those we can identify for outreach and bring you know have people messaging at those sites saying if you brought a boat from Canada, here's what you need to be doing. But if it's an official event, natural resources, uh, they have to get a permit. And on that permit, the event organizers have to have a wash station on the site. At least that's what was happening for your region where Belfin for any um, events, but in Canada. In Canada. In Canada. In Canada. Um, Gary, <laughs> what's your overall budget for all the events? What's the budget? Um, our budget right now, from a nonprofit standpoint, we have a three year project. I, I don't know, like we have $100,000 maybe to deal with this as an individual organization. Um, and there's no money set aside. Um, you know, sort of show up somewhere. Everybody agrees, like, this is something bad. We need to deal with this. And then everybody does the thing where they all like point their gun at each other, like in the, the standoff, like, response fund or anything nothing like no everyone looks at each other and says like okay, who's going to deal with this and then everybody kind of slowly backs me just a quick note about the border I mean, customs and border protection does do inspections for things like invasive species but if they're putting in on the canadian side and then going down the river or whatever i, I don't think that's going to be covered but if you're crossing the border CBP working together with the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service and myself as a state plant regulatory official. We we work together to try to make sure these kind of things are minimized. It's not going to ever stop it, but that is something that's there. And my budget is research, not management, unfortunately. Um, and we have actually zero instances of um, aquatic management, even for irrigation water bill phone problems. We've known that that's been there for eight years and that has not increased. That being said, if any of you are doing any aquatic management of invasive species, if you want to email me the amount that, a general amount that you're spending, I use these numbers to show our regulators what management costs. Um, because it's so new, they have no idea what to do, and they have no idea what it costs or how to plan for that. So I'm looking to collect information on that if you're to share. Thank you. 
We'll take one more quick question and I'll, and I'll remind everyone that the um, speakers are going to be in the panel later so we can have more questions there on the front. I have some hearing limitations, so limit my speech understanding. So you might have answered to this. Uh, are you isolated as a province? What, what's happening west of you in Quebec? And my particular interest is in the province of Nova Scotia. Thank you. Um, we are, on paper, we're not isolated, but we are when it comes to response to the regulatory stuff. So even though we have the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which, or sorry, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, which is a national, it's very different. The level of response and the capacity for response is very different in Quebec. Fortunately, they have more capacity, so there are plans in place at the municipal level to put in boat wash stations to try and deal with that in Quebec. Um, we have very limited capacity in New Brunswick, and it, it is it is fairly segmented. Um, in the province of Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council, so our counterpart, did just get a very large grant to increase their clean, drain, dry messaging, and they will have a full wild boat wash station. But again, there it, it's it's very the conversation is very limited right now in terms of regulatory um, uh, approaches. Although there is word on the street that uh, they are looking at changing some of the regulations to make it, uh, to bring it in similar to what the Western states and provinces have, which is you're not allowed to transport, you have to clean during dry. They're hoping to change the legislation so that can apply in our region as well. But for the most part, it is very, it's very choppy, even though we're so interconnected geographically. Yeah, just to summarize that, just as the issues don't stop at the border, and we have extra borders because it stops the province. Invasive species issues are managed by the provincial governments. Uh, some governments have mandates for that, others do not, or they don't. There's people like Chris and I trying to fill in the gaps, trying to motivate the government um, to recognize these issues before they become bigger issues. But yes, the major divide is that there are different rules as you go through the different provinces and we're small. So you know, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia together. That's a lot of. Uh, boundary lines for a small area. Thank you. Thank you both so much. That was very, very helpful. Thank you. Up next, we have Francis Brottingham from the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, who's going to talk about um, updates. Okay. There are things like a little uses. Thanks, Colin. Oh. Perfect. Yeah. Um, geez, it was really good timing on having folks from New Brunswick up here to talk a little bit about uh, zebra mussels. Um, it's certainly a topic that we recently become aware of. In fact, it's in October of 2022 that we received notice uh, from British Columbia. I was joking with Chris and Meg earlier about then. I was like, why are we getting communication from British Columbia if the issue is over in New Brunswick and Quebec? And uh, but anyways, um, which, which we actually learned of that. Well, let me back up. I should introduce myself. So I, I'm Colin already mentioned my name's Francis Rodigan. So I'm the director of fisheries and hatcheries with the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. So I oversee our fisheries biologists. I also oversee our, our hatchery programs. Um, our agency does not have any dedicated staff, a couple of exceptions to this, to manage and work on AIS related issues. That being said, we are responsible for managing and conserving our fish and wildlife resources in the state. And so we do devote time to try to manage the fish and wildlife threats in, in particular. Um, what I was going to talk a little bit about today was um, some of the, the new investments that we're, we're planning to undertake. And, and a lot of this relates to um, Colin had mentioned earlier that we had received um, authorization to hire, create and hire a new position last year, which was really great. We, again, have not had any capacity, dedicated capacity to manage fish and wildlife invasive threats in, in the state. So um, it's taken us almost a year to actually find somebody. We've gone through multiple interview processes, but we finally found an individual who will be joining us in the next month. Um, her name is Dakota Stankowski. She's finishing up her graduate degree in, in Wisconsin, and she's got a, a rather interesting background. Besides being a fisheries scientist, 
Um, she also has a background in, in liners, dual liners, when she received her bachelor's degree in chemistry and in environmental education. So both those background areas are really germane to the role that she'll perform uh, with the department in the new position. Um, so we're looking forward, and, and hopefully she will show up at the end of May. She assures me she will once her degree program is finished up. So, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense um, of uh, what we envision for this new position. Um, this is going to be really our point of contact within the agency to kind of coordinate any of the fish and wildlife threats, particularly within the aquatic realm. Um, and uh, it'll be really important for this position, obviously, to be coordinating uh, with the federal agencies, but as well as our sister agency, the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and and a, an important part of that coordination and collaboration is really to be able to utilize um, resources that may be stronger in one agency than in another. And, and a really good example of that is as we've rolled out our recent clean drain dry campaign, um, our agency um, had a role in, in trying to promote and advance uh, education and awareness regarding clean drain dry. We've got, without a doubt, one of the best information and education um, divisions within state government. We're able to capitalize that in, in helping to create more awareness to the public. We also maintain a huge uh, email database, really, for all the customers, all, all the folks that are boating and fishing and hunting and trapping and all of that. So we can really get out to a lot of the members of the public that are engaged in water-based recreation. Um, we also support the main warden service, which is the agency that has all of the law enforcement responsibilities. So any of the laws that are out there, um, they're all enforced under Title 12 by our, our main warden service. We actually utilized warden service through a number of details last year to come and push out the clean drain dry campaign. So as wardens were out there interfacing with the voting public, they were they were messaging on those on the need to clean drain dry. So and then DEP, they had some staff, fortunately. Um, and so they've got uh, some staff and and a little bit more uh, financial support than we do to manage AIS issues. And so they were able to bring some funding together too to help create um, some new signage that will be going up around the state at, at all of our dog bump launches. So coordination will be really critical moving forward. Other aspect that would be important in this position is really statewide planning. I'm going to talk about that in, in a few moments. We also have, as we just learned, regional threats uh, that are not too far from, um, from our borders. Um, it'll be really important for this position to understand what is nearby and to start thinking about some surveillance programs now uh, and monitoring to, uh, to track anything that might be coming into the state. Um, surveillance is interesting because, you know, and it's so I deal mostly with invasive fish issues, right? That, that's the area where we as a division spend most of our time. Um, and most of the time, uh, we're not aware of new infestations until they're very, very well established. So once again, as was pointed out by Megan Kristen, um, if you don't get early detection, your ability to respond and remediate that threat is significantly weakened. And so what we've identified, in fact, it's in our 15-year, uh, recently completed 15-year fishery strategic plan, it's really the need to develop some new surveillance programs to monitor for invasive fish introductions. So we have the ability to get in there early and hopefully try to remediate these threats. Um, certainly, environmental uh, DNA um, uh, testing, water testing is certainly providing a really good tool moving forward. We plan to be utilizing that as some of our higher value fisheries, particularly some of our more rare fisheries like for RHR. Um, to build those into our, our programs. We are definitely also interested in utilizing the public more um, on the surveillance front, particularly with uh, collecting water samples that can be analyzed for a whole suite of, of different types of invasive fish, but as, as well as uh, zebra mussels. So uh, once the community is on board, um, it's really important. 
development of relationships is probably the most important thing she'll have to work on coming on board. Uh, so the plan is to, to start internal um, and have uh, work with all of our region staff to build those relationships. So understand. So I mean, she's coming from another state. She doesn't understand exactly what our programs are. Understanding those work programs will provide the ability for her to understand how she can integrate various elements of AIS uh, monitoring and assessment um, as work plans are being implemented. So that yeah. We certainly want uh, Dakota to be working with DEP as well. And um, as they embark on various projects, uh, I would like this individual to actually spend time with DEP. Um, so the first effort will be building relationships and understanding the different work programs within our agency and within DEP um, so that she can begin to think about strategies and, and, and approaches. Um, I've got three top priorities this person will be working on when, uh, when she comes on board. Um, one of the highest priorities right now is actually developing a statewide prioritization plan to manage invasive threats around the state. Um, and this is particularly important in, uh, in river systems. So in our state, we've got a lot of dams on our waterways. And dams are great in one sense that they prevent fish from moving upstream. So that's great, right? It prevents invasive fish from moving upstream, but it also prevents native fish from being able to access important habitats. Um, particularly when we're working with our sister agency, the Department of Marine Resources, we're trying to restore migratory species of fish. Um, they're always interested, obviously, proving passage at those dam obstructions. But um, in providing passage for native species, what that's also doing is creating an opportunity for invasive species to also ascend and upstream and further and impact other waters and those drainages. So there is a need to really look at where are our highest priorities in terms of managing for AIS and, uh, and creating a plan to support that, as well as to supporting our sister agency, uh, again, who's responsible for managing restoration of migratory fish. So that'll be our, one of our high priorities. And we've got a lot of dams that are currently licensed by the state and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that are about for relicensing. So we really need to get a handle on this quick because right now what's happening, a project comes for review and all of a sudden everybody's scrambling, I'm scrambling, BMR scrambling, and we're all trying to put the pieces together, but we haven't really had the benefit of planning. So the, there's a lot more challenges without the back in the absence of planning to navigate some of these challenging issues that have been passage with AIS control. Um, another priority, second priority, I don't know if it's necessarily second or first, but certainly a deeper muscle. Um, we did hire um, Charlie Todd, uh, who had worked as an endangered species biologist for the department uh, under contract. Um, and it was just after we found the uh, Dizzy Road Muscle Infestation, uh, just about the park. And uh, what we asked him to do was to put together a um, park uh, that would uh, kind of summarize uh, a whole bunch of different things a little bit on like history, economic, ecological impacts, um, and, and what's going on, and, and go back in terms of what they're aware of in terms of the new infestation there. Um, and then that, that report, um, which is still in grand form, but, but it's identified about 16, really more than that, but a minimum of 16 different action items. So there's quite a bit there to work from. And we wanted to get the report compiled before our new AIS coordinator position came on board so that she would have some footing and some awareness for what the issue is and begin thinking about next steps. And then the last um, priority that I'll mention here, and it's something many folks may not be aware of, but um, we one of the few states in the entire Northeast that manage um, a chemical reclamation program. And that's a program whereby we use uh, a chemical referred to as rope known um, to, uh, to euthanize fish. And it's, it's the way in some places that we're able to actually restore populations where we've had invasive fish show up, uh, where we come in and we apply this chemical and it, it pretty much eliminates all the fish in those systems and those systems are, are restocked. 
we uh, about 15 years ago, we had a project of a uh, big green lawn where one of our 12 endemic populations part of charm streamlined by smelt introduction. And uh, we went in there uh, in using our chemical reclamation program. We have indicated um, everything that was in there. Before we did that, however, we actually took broodstock from uh, the charm population and they were cultivated in a private facility. And for completion of the reclamation itself, uh, we took progeny that were cultivated in the tree and re reintroduced them back to the water. And we now have um, a population restored there. So, so we have that ability. Those are really complex, really expensive projects. Uh, but it's, we're really fortunate in the state that we've managed this program because it does give us an important tool in our toolbox moving forward. But there's a lot to it. It involves having all our staff licensed and keep up that licensing and, and training. It involves maintaining a lot of equipment. It involves um, a lot of understanding of how to design these projects. They're, they're not simple projects to design. Um, and there's a lot that goes into it to minimize discharge from the area you're trying to treat. Um, there's licensing issues. Um, since we utilize uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife for fish restoration funds for those projects, there's also expectations that we need to meet um, in receiving funds for these projects. And, and so there's a process we need to go through to make sure that there are no rare or endangered species that are potentially impacted when we undertake these projects. So, I, I just want to offer that that limited kind of insight into you know where we're at as an agency. Really, really pleased that the legislature supported this new position. Uh, it's been created. Um, I would just also like to say, if it were not for um, some increases in the milk foil sticker fund, uh, we would not have been able to, to create that position. Uh, the funding that we currently receive, which is split between our agency and, and DEP. We get about 20%, and that's utilized predominantly to maintain uh, two law enforcement staff and, and manage all of our um, laws, and, but their focus in general over the over the entire board service team is to implement uh, and manage uh, outreach and compliance with laws that, regarding AIS. Um, we also use a portion of the funds that we receive to generate the milk well stickers that people need to buy and put on their bottles. So um, that's about all we can do with our 20%, two wardens worth of work and then our stickers. So I think we received just over like $100,000 with the, the, the last time that the no foil sticker revenue increase went into effect, which was like two, was two years ago. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, that, that was a really blessing for the department and it's allowed the department to take on a, a more active role in, in managing and coordinating with our partners and trying to address the AIS issues. So, with that, I'll, I'll, if there's a question or two, you have to answer them. Likewise, I'll, I'll be around if folks want to catch me off, off the podium. Thank you. Question. Yeah, so we, we heard Kristen speak about the uh, importance of legislation for pulling drain plugs to prevent the spread of zebra mussels and of course other invasive species. And uh, this year and, and previously, many of us in this room have advocated for a bill that would that would require that. I have not was not supported that effort. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to that. Well I will say that in Boston that an effort is supported. Um, I think what we are challenged with right now with the pending bill is to um, to have some language that can actually be enforced. Um, when anytime we've got new legislation that's proposed, um, our board of service takes a careful look to understand what it can, what it can enforce. And one of the challenges with you know draining uh, a boat, our board of service staff can't actually view and access everything in the boat that's containing water. So there's some real challenges in terms of actually being able to effectively help. Um, but I think there's a genuine interest within the department to try to figure out what can be advanced to support clean drain drive. Um, the other piece to this too, as more and more laws get generated, there's an expectation that some of the board service staff also have to enforce all these new laws. So it does place more burden and more responsibility on the board service. So I, I think as we talk about new laws and 
talk about the need for more enforcement. If there's an expectation that those laws are going to be enforced, there needs to be discussions about, you know, having staffing that can support that effort. But conceptually, the department is very supported in clean, rain, dry. Um, we certainly want the needle as much as you folks do. Um, we just need to have everything in, in the right balance to make it work. To add to that, the same the same concerns have been brought up as well in your brother discussing that. Like, yes, this we would love to have this place, but we don't necessarily have the resources to actually monitor and make sure that the rules being followed. And and that's the, that's the stumbling block, not the desire to do it. It's just the the, the operationalizing of said legislation seems to be the, the issue. I mean, that pending legislation is still there. There's still a trust in working on that, trying to get something that, that's manageable through the act. Um, and I have a feeling, you know, that bill, I mean, I think I have, I think there's, well, I've touched, I think, well, five different AIS related bills. And there's some other, you know, bills that are related to funding, you know, that may have a nexus with, you know, LD92, which deals with the clean drain dry, um, in terms of discussing what resources are needed. And again, how can we frame up a law that's actually enforceable? So. Thank you so much, Francis. I remind everyone, let's keep them in Francis is going to be on the panel later. Um, and uh, up, then we, up next, we have Chris Riley, who's going to talk about uh, currency vote inspections. Hello. You tell them anything. Okay. Should we? Okay. I probably should use them. Okay. I'm sure at some point I'll try to change the slides with the microphone to speak into the pointer. <laughs> so uh, my name is Chris Riley with the invasive uh, unit in DEP. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, I stepped into the role that Karen handled and filled for uh, 20 years. Uh, big shoes to fill. And uh, many of you are familiar with her. And I'm still getting to know pretty much most of you in this room. I hope I can do right by her. And I'm going to say before I get started, uh, obviously, we're looking at uh, increasing the effectiveness of the courtesy vote inspection program by looking at 20 years of data. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is stuff that Karen pretty much already kind of knew after doing this for 20 years. And when a lot of you that have been doing this program for a long time kind of already know uh, what I'm trying to do here really is just put numbers to it. Uh, you know, just you know your own ramps better than you know anyone else. But now it's nice to be able to say, hey, you know, we know certain percentages of uh, plants being found are happening in certain time frames. Even if you already know it, now you have the percentages to put behind it. So 20 years of inspections. Uh, invasives have been around in the state for uh, quite some time, going back, I believe, to the 70s in Spago. Uh, they've been on the radar. Many groups have been working towards uh, identifying the risks in certain lakes uh, for quite, a, quite some time. But uh, early 2000s, the main DEP started the inaugural uh, year of uh, the invasives unit, uh, John McFedrin being the uh, uh, first employee in the unit. Uh, we have here um, a graph. This, this should be familiar. Uh, this, this was also in the, uh, or his domain the already is in the handbook, of uh, invasives towards 2001. Um, as you can see, the program, you know, focusing on the prevention of uh, spreading, reducing spread, trying to be consistent here, to prevent and reduce spreading, uh, you can see the decline in the first decade. And then it has kind of leveled off uh, since about 2000, give or take. We've been. Okay, so it's about 2012. We've stated about 80,000 or about 80,000 inspections. And what we have here, I'll, you know, just to put some of this in perspective, uh, in 2004, see if I can get it better with this pointer here, just over 30,000 inspections done by 27 groups. We go to last year and we had almost 90,000 inspections done by over 60 groups. 
So what's the current status? What are our numbers? Uh, I have over 1.3 million inspection records to play with. And uh, when I was hired on and they said, we'd like you to take a look at this data, I got real excited because that's the stuff that I enjoy doing the most. However, has a lot of information to ship with those through. Over 45,000 of those inspections are ones where one or more plant fragment was found. So I can only say that there were 45,000 45, plus inspections where plant was found. And the usual number of plants is much higher because it doesn't account for how many plant fragments were found in that given inspection. And of those 45,000 inspections, or 45,000 plus, over 3,500 of them were invasives that were prevented from entering or leaving a water body. Uh, this is great work, uh, and we appreciate every inspection that has been done, we truly do. However, Maine has over 6,000 lakes and 30,000 miles of rivers and, streams, rivers and streams, and only about 321 water bodies have dedicated associations. And again, to put those numbers in perspective, 60 groups last year conducted inspections on 118 water bodies last year. That is roughly or a little less than 2% of the water bodies. Okay, again, great work, but there's a lot of ground to cover, or a lot of water to cover, excuse me. Well, well there's two ways to widen that. One is, excuse me, one is spatially. Uh, we can try to cover a greater geographic area, get inspections going on more lakes. The one that I'm going to talk about today, however, because the spatially is uh, another issue for another time, but today we're going to talk about temporally, all right? And inspections over a longer time period or a more targeted time period in the course of a week or the course of the, uh, the windows and months that are being covered. So in that focus on time frames, uh, how do we use this available uh, data to improve our ability to protect the resource? Uh, do we shoot for less coverage during the week and extend coverage into further weekends? Do we shift the window? And to begin with that, I had to start looking at how do I use the data moving forward? And what we have here, uh, I hope everybody wanted to look at a bunch of graphs and you have to go back to those, those exercises, interpreting them on the fly here. We have inspections plotted with the invasives found per year. And what we find early on, a lot of variability in the invasives found for ever increasing numbers of inspections. And it makes it tough to kind of project outwards based on this particular data set because we, if I do the projections based on or predictions based on this, it's going to skew everything downward. And are we expecting to see fewer invasives? Probably not. So what I wanted to do was look at something consistent to be able to examine what may happen, what, what suggestions will be the most uh, uh, useful. And around 2014, it was determined that all of these, I just want to say all of these invasives we believe are valid. However, you got to think that at this time, a lot of programs were not in place. A lot of, place of the uh, locations where these inspections were going on had very, you know, had in infestations of varying intensity and funding had not necessarily reached the levels that it's at now. So, in order to stay consistent in what I'm doing moving forward, I decided that for these purposes, going from 2014 to 2022 was probably my best bet in terms of getting, oh, in, in terms of going through my slides too quickly, excuse me. In, in terms of what we will likely see moving forward. So what variables did we look at? Uh, the CBI data set is, Pretty darn big. Um, I could look at last lake visited, time of day to the hour. I could look at weeks, you know, inspections by week, registration numbers where we can track boats between different lakes, uh, infested versus uninfested, site specific, spatially, organizationally, state registrations in and out of state, we could compare it to weather patterns, gas prices. And at a certain point, John and Denise and Tony had to say, there's focus. And so we decided then that. For the purposes of maximizing our coverage or our efficiency, we wanted to look at the time of day. We wanted to look at day of the week, the month, and very deep, very uh, importantly tied to the month, the beginning and end of season days for a lot of these organizations. I looked at both the overall counts, the big picture of how many things have been found during the inspections, how many inspections have been 
And it's look at percentages. Percentages will give you a better idea of the value of a specific inspection. It kind of normalizes the infer because you'll see that later on when we talk about the months and the end of season dates, we have very valuable inspections for far fewer groups. And so by the numbers, some of these months don't seem as important, but in terms of how likely you are to find plants, they become very important. And then finally, we decided to focus on the percent of inspections where plants were found. It's like, well, why not the invasives? Well, what you're looking for, first and foremost, are DC plant tracker. There is zero chance of an invasive if you didn't find a plant tracker at all. But if you are finding plants on the boats, you then automatically have a certain chance of finding an invasive. Of course, that goes up or down depending whether you're on an infested or an uninfested water body, but across the board, it's about a 3% chance. So there's, you know, it's kind of like Jim Carrey and Dumb and Dumb. So you're saying there's a chance. And, and of course, in the preliminary stages, uh, Tony, who pointed out the increase, we've been all situations where it's more than one plant found on the boat. Well, there you go. That would go into a record as one for plants found. So we get into 40,000 plus, it is 40,000 plus, 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 plus. Okay. Time of day. So this is number of inspections by direction, by hour. Again, going back to the, you know, interpreting graphs on the fly here. And what we look at are two different peaks. All right. Wrong button. What did I just do? <laughs> just, you, told me, you told me not to pay, yeah, you never hit the top button. I hit the top button four times. <laughs> Apologies. Yes, <laughs> I'm also stuck touching the <laughs> Apologies. And so, yes. And we see on boats entering by the hour and then boats leaving, we see two different peaks. Okay. Now, this is inspections, which gives an idea of usage. All right. Not perfect idea of usage, but, you know, in general, you know, that's when you're seeing most boats entering or leaving. And when you plot them over top of one another, uh, two things come to mind. One, you kind of see where they overlap. And two, why didn't I just use two different colors of bars? It would have been much cleaner. Um, the answer to the first one gives an idea of what we can do to maximize our time. Uh, one thing that I will say right off the bat, none of these of what I'm saying are directives. These are simply suggestions and numbers for where you can maximize your efficiency. I know that not everybody can cover every ramp for you know 120 hours a week. This is why these slides are important because if we look at, let's say, the eight hour window from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., well, then we've just covered 70% of boats leaving and the 86 percent entering, 86% of boats leaving. If you have to choose a window, this is the one that maximizes your time. How, and this is where your local knowledge is important. You know your ramps better than I do. If you are seeing more people entering in the morning, you shift the window. If you see more people leaving, you shift the window. And especially whether you are infested or uninfested. An uninfested lake, you are more worried about what's coming in. Shift the window two hours towards the start of the day. And instead, shift it to catch all of the boats leaving. Now, as we move through all of this, one thing that I should also say is, um, I love looking at this. Give me more reasons. If you say, hey, Chris, what does it say for our ramp? What does it say for our organization? Those are the kinds of things that I would like to be able to provide on demand. Uh, just, you know, don't demand too quickly during the field season, you know, that kind of thing. But I would like to be able to start having more specific discussions because your ramp, you know, may have a very different character than what you see here. And that's where, you know, getting the local knowledge is extremely important. But these are generalities. And that is the window that will give you the most bang for your buck. Day of the week. By count, Saturday, Sunday, and Friday are still the most important. You're going to see the most boats. You're going to see the most plants. You're going to see the most invasives. What I'd like to illustrate here, though, is that if you 
take a look at the percent of inspections with plants found, you go from a Sorry, I'll look at that. I'm not just gonna look at the next slide. Okay. So, so you look at the graph on our uh, on your right. You'll see that, in spite of the absolute numbers, when we look at this by count in terms of the percent of inspections where you find a plant, it is a lot closer than you would think. You know, you look at, you know, your Tuesday's got a bit of a dip in it, but it's only 1.2% spread. It's a relatively similar chance, regardless of the day of the week, that you're going to find a plant. Now, what that means is you can't, you know, not, and I'm not saying that you're doing this, but you can't take an inspection off. Just because it's a, Wednesday, a lazy Wednesday afternoon and there hasn't been a lot of traffic, You've got to treat each inspection as though you've got about a three, three and a half percent chance of finding a plant. And of course, local knowledge, if you know that your ramp is close to thick vegetation, you're going to have to be even more aware of what's going on here. But what this illustrates is you're just about, not quite equally, but you have similar chances of finding a plant regardless of the day of the week. Can't take it off. Can't take an inspection off, I should say. There's a tiny Here's the one that I think is the, the big one for today. And again, that can be not busy. These are not derivatives. These are suggestions. And I understand that coverage can and will be an issue. However, by the numbers, these are inspections plotted against plants found. Okay. And you notice, again, July, you know, June, July, August, then we can be used to peak, to the peak season, right? That's when everything's ramping up. That's when the most groups are actually inspecting. If you only had to choose a few months to cover, it's a no brainer. However, I would like to call your attention to May and September. For the time period that I'm looking at, that is, they're separated by less than 2,000 inspections difference. But look at the number of plants found. It's three times higher in September. When you look at this in terms of a rate, September becomes quite interesting. And then furthermore, September is king as far as the percentages go. Look at how much higher it is than April, May, and June. And October is trying to sneak in there, but those numbers are so small, I don't feel comfortable making any sort of statement about October. But almost three times as high a percentage in September as there is in May. So you are more likely to find a plant on a given inspection in September. And when you think about it, you know, in May, the vegetative growth is just getting, you know, kick-started. You know, you may not really be seeing all that much until the end of May, but in September, that biomass is going strong. This is where things become, I don't want to say scary, but, you know, this is where it becomes concerning. September and May are basically mirror images of each other as far as groups and their coverage. And if you look at them, the way to interpret this is that's the percentage of groups that have in May started before first. There's only 35% groups that have started before May 22nd. And of course, Memorial Day, that number just in pockets. Same thing in September. By the what's fourth week or third week in September. We only have about 75, or we are we lost 75% of our coverage. For those of you wondering why is there six weeks in May or five weeks in May and September, that is because in the 2014 to 2022 window, sometimes it includes it sits in one or two weeks on either side. I, I plotted this and I was like, well, how did September get bigger? But well, that's why. Now, going back to the rates of plants being found. You can see, and I keep the scales on each graph consistent so that you can then again see the rate of plants being found per inspection being significantly higher in September. And not just for part of September, almost through the entire month. So for again, and I'll, I'll 
This puts those together. If we look at week 38 in September, you still have about a almost a 5% chance of seeing a plant in a given inspection, and if we've lost 75% of our coverage. That's why the end dates and September inspections are something where we need to, if possible, try to see how we can shift our window, okay? Again, all the caveats, so if I understand that coverage may be an issue, I also understand that your rank may be very different, and if it is, please tell me because I'd love to sift through the data and see because we can start thinking about what we can do on a per organization, you know, basis, you know, things like that, because I can always run those numbers. But this is where if you had to choose, saying we do, but if you had to, maybe a few of those earlier weekends in May might not be as important as some of the later weekends in September. Or Going by the absolute numbers, you know, maybe sacrifice a couple of Tuesdays and Wednesdays if it means tacking that funding and that coverage onto a couple extra weekends in September. It's all about seeing as many plants or seeing as getting as many inspections done as possible and seeing that many more plants. Oh, I got like one minute left. And it's okay, I'll still be around the questions. I love the questions. So conclusions. Um, each inspection has a similar probability of finding a plant. Again, we can't take an inspection off. Okay. June, July, if we're going just by the numbers, you know, the, the no brainers are cover your Saturdays and your Sundays and cover June, July, and August. We are darn grateful for all of the work that you've been doing. My goodness, it's amazing. And if you had to, if you have to prioritize, that's it. June, July, August, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. You're, you're going to be catching the vast majority of what we are seeing. That said, you know, more inspections, even more sales. However, if you can make it a priority or if you can, you know, rework things, September coverage should be a priority, especially on Saturdays and Sundays. You know, do we sacrifice midweek coverage for some end of season weekends? If possible, yes. If possible. I know it's a challenge to find coverage, but imagine if we can ramp up that coverage, that end dates in September. You know, if 50% of groups are still covering instead of only 25%, just imagine how much more we'd see in September. Um, I was hoping to have too many questions, but I'm having too much fun, so I just kept talking. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, Chris. And we will do questions for you, but during the panel section, to keep us going in time. Uh, next, we have. Uh, Ballast tanks as a vector uh, with Lauren Gifford from the Lakes Environmental Association and Susan Gatton from this case. Thanks, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Gatton. I'm with me, Lakes. I'm happy to be here to talk a little bit about. Um, some way boat legislation that's the that books. Well, it's in the process in the pipeline. And I guess I will start. Hopefully, I can figure this out. Um, my name is Lauren Pickford. I'm from LEA. Um, we're going to be talking about ballast tanks as a uh, vector. I'm hoping to show you a little video of these uh, wake boats, but for, the, for time's sake, I'm going to. Um, so these are a special type of boat that can kind of find a loophole and clean drain dry ballasted boats on inland waters uh, and historically ballast tanks have been used for ships uh, to stabilize them in marine waters in the Great Lakes. These ballast tanks are a bit different than say a live well because they only have a small opening for bringing water in and bringing water out. Um, they help weigh down the hull of the boat, and you can actually choose where you want to put the water. You can only put it in the green tanks to sort of create a really tall wave if that's what you wanted. If you're having problems with stability because these boats are pretty powerful, you can add water to the yellow and orange tanks. Um, after the activity, the tanks are released back into the lake, uh, but they're very hard to drain completely um, if not impossible. Uh, as we all know, some of these invasives are very tiny, including seeds and fragments from invasive plants. And we've been talking about zebra mussels all day. Um, it feels like uh, the spiny water flea. 
Um, and some of these invasives can live for a really long time uh, inside ballast tanks. And even if you're careful to not fill your ballast tanks um, in weedy areas, there may be these tiny organisms, um, even microscopic, that you can't see um, that you're sucking up to these ballast tanks. So the current management um, is clean, drain, dry, right? We all know that, and it works. Um, but it's difficult or impossible with these internal ballast tanks. Um, there's two types. Some boats come manufactured with them where they have an internal pump that fills them and drains them. And then there's also these um, sort of sump bags that you can put in the compartment of a boat to turn it into one of these ballasted wake boats. Um, they're very hard to completely drain um, because they just have a small opening. Manufacturers currently recommend a decontamination process um, where you fill each tank all the way up with 150 degree water for 10 to 15 seconds and flush them. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no hot water decontamination stations in Maine. Um, most home hot water tanks only reach 120, and so you need a hot water pressure washer in order to do this sort of decontamination between water body. Um, and let me I'm going to go back one and tell you that. In, in Maine, we don't, um, our CBIs don't identify a, a ballasted boat from a regular boat. It's not on the paper, so we don't know exactly how many of these ballasted boats we have in our lakes. But um, New Hampshire, the New Hampshire Lakes Cost Program had a report in 2019, um, and they indicated that um, of 96,000 boats inspected, over 2,000 were wake boats. Um, and there were 73 percent of those boats uh, came from a water body with an invasive. So um, I think I'm going to skip on to the next one. So in other waters, I mean, ballasts have been around for a long time, not necessarily in inland waters, uh, but there are laws on marine waters and in the Great Lakes. And uh, Megan and Kristen touched on this a little bit. Um, you have to have certain permits. And there are federal laws that manage ballast tanks on marine waters and um, in the Great Lakes, but they there are no specific laws pertaining to ballast tanks in Maine. Um, live wells are supposed to be inspected and drained, but they're a bit easier to get to because they open because you can reach into them versus a sort of closed tank that's inside your boat. Um, but I think on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Susan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is um, related to the, um, really could, could be related to invasive species, depending on where this, invasive species management, depending on where the, this goes. But just, um, just to fill you in on this group that's been meeting over the last couple of years, the Maine Boating Impact Coalition was, we started meeting in the fall of 2021. And a lot of lake association people, uh, representatives, plus just individuals interested in the topic of um, what to do about wave boats in, in terms of the impacts to shorelines, as well as the potential risk that um, they're gonna that they do pose for the spread of invasive species. So, uh, spent a full year looking at scientific literature, looking at um, connecting with partners across the country who are working on the same issue. We had speakers from IFW and from other states to ask questions. And the bottom line is we developed um, a proposal LD693, which is in front of the IFW committee right now. It was actually voted on not to pass, but um, there's a big movement um, to, keep, to keep it alive and bring it to the full legislator, legislature because there is a huge support for this bill. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the bill. It is, um, it would keep the activity of wake surfing uh, 500 feet from shore and waters at least 20 feet deep. I mentioned it has overwhelming public support. At this point, there is no invasive, that we did not address um, the invasive risk to um, these ballasted boats. It came up in, it was a big topic of discussion throughout the whole year um, that we spent formulating the policy. And um, it's definitely still on our radar. The Maine Boating Impact Coalition is definitely still thinking about the invasive aspect, but right now it's focused on wake. Um, boat operation, um, there's some enforcement concerns from IFW, summer camps have issues, uh, some marina owners, industry representatives have problems with the bill. Uh, you know, it's a huge percentage of um, marina sales. You don't have to sell a lot of wake boats to, to 
really increase, be they're a big part of your, uh, to be a big part of your income. They're very expensive. So as I mentioned, there's divided room. Uh, not to pass, but there's significant uh, energy around um, keeping the bill alive. Um, just as I have a different, very different viewpoint from Francis on laws and enforcement. I un I understand the enforcement question and, and the issues, but I also think there's incredible value for all of you um, to be able to, you know, when you're interacting with people and talking to people. I think you, there's great value in you being able to say there's a law about X or Y or Z pertinent to invasives. And um, that's a huge, that's huge, that's huge. And sure, you can say, you can do an education campaign and I uh, fully support education and outreach as a way, but I think you on the, on the front lines of this battle, I think having a law in place is um, three quarters, 80%, 90%, of the um, battle, is, it takes place right there. So um, there is a LD-379 passed, and it is a task force that's going to be set up to look at this issue. Um, and we have main likes is hoping to participate. And one of the questions we want to see specifically um, for this task force to address is the endangered, I mean, the invasive species spread risk. And so hopefully we'll be working on that this year. Um, as I mentioned, LD 693 is has not done yet. Um, also, just so you know, Colby is doing a weight boat study up on um, East Pond in the Belgrades, and I mentioned the invasive issue, which is going to certainly come along with this bill as it bill and other bills as it moves. Um, so that's our quick update. Um, thank you. I'm going to try to play that video during the transition period. Uh, hopefully, somebody hit next column. Thank you, uh, Susan and Lauren. Well, let's do, since you guys, neither of you are on the panel, I think, so I'm going to entertain a question. It's actually more just a comment. So um, we're currently working with a company in Quebec called O0 Solutions. Um, they put together different boat wash station setups. Um, some people might have heard of CD3 yeah. here, but those are like a vacuum system. It's not hot water. So they actually have created a special tool specifically for wake boats and washing out the ballast system. So it's connected to a hot, hot pressure, hot water pressure, you know what I mean? Yeah, hot water pressure washer. Um, and it's it uh, it's like a wand that sticks on, suctions to the part of the boat, that small opening, and it actually flushes out the hot water throughout the ballast tank. So just to put that on your rear hand. Yeah. Right. So, in, in case you didn't hear Kristen mention that there is a new mechanism out there, um, commercial patenting, I'm sure, it can flush out these systems that's on the market and help with uh, water and making it, which is which is really good. Uh, one more question, Annie. Last summer, I started asking around at various camps that I'm familiar with. And um, can you hear me back no. there? Oh, yeah. Okay. And what I found was that some of the camps were aware of this, but the water, the the waterfront counselors and the the uh, counselors who dealt with the boats didn't know anything about it. And I think it would be wonderful if could get it to those counselors so they are aware of the dangers of it. Yeah. I think that's a great point, Anne. Um, we're taking this moment right along. Um, thank you all so much again. Up next, we have Davis Hass, Representative Davis Hassenbus and John McFedrin. Possibly myself, there'll be more 2023 legislative bills. Oh, Davis. Oh, I gotta do one more. Little bit of, you know, small. I, 
Very interesting. And then we've been working with firms in the Hudson Post for many years on late bills, and he has been a wonderful ally toward the colleagues. So uh, thank you in advance, and thank you for coming today. We would we'd love to hear from you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. This is a great place to be, and I'm so pleased that so many are concerned with local uh, water bodies because Maine has some of the cleanest water in the country. We want to make sure that we keep it that way. Um, and it takes all of us. It's not just uh, the legislature. It's not just the DEP and W. It's not just the labor organizations. It's not just private citizens. It's everybody working together. And without that, um, without everybody working in tandem, then we're we're going to miss a step, and uh, the results can be disastrous as as what we've seen. I mean, I've heard a lot today about various pieces of legislation, um, so I think everybody already beat me to the punch, so to speak, with, with many of these things. And um, one of my colleagues, a Representative Bill Bridgia from Augusta, who's also here, I'm just going to let him speak of one of his very important bills, but he had to go to a meeting, and so. Um, I will do that for him. And uh, before I get into this, please at any time interrupt me, ask questions. Uh, I think everybody's done a great job here explaining the, the content of the different bills that we're seeing in the legislature. Um, but if you have any questions about the process, because you know what the bill says and its content um, is important, but also how to get something across the finish line, um, you know, and where in the process it's going is helpful as well, too. And to that end, we need your help because a lot of this stuff happens to us. constituents and our citizens are pushing us to make sure that we're enacting laws that are going to better benefit them. Um, and with that, what I'd like to talk about first, I'm just going to let Representative Bridgie talk about this, but um, I'll mention this bill. It's one that I haven't heard a lot mentioned in here, but it's LD 164, which is an act for the funding of lake water quality restoration and protection projects. Um, and what this bill does is it basically puts funding into a um, yeah. funding into a project a proposal that hasn't been funded in a number of years. And what that funding would do is assist municipalities who you know, are willing to contribute some of their own funds, municipalities, lake organizations, um, lake associations, uh, to sort of work together to give them grants to help water quality within their lake, whether that be through uh, algae or through invasive species or what have you. Um, that bill passed unanimously out of committee and is, in a, is sitting on the appropriations table, which means that the bill passed, it's good, but because it is money, and it's a million dollars the first year, it's $1.5 million the second year, um, the Appropriations Committee also has to approve that. And for them to approve it, they have to approve everything that's going to take money. So that's you know funding for housing, funding for um, mental health services. And there's a lot of priorities that AFA has. Um, but keeping a clean environment and healthy lakes is a huge priority, especially when we've seen the economic return that it has. So what Bill asked me to ask all of you to do is to write the members of the AFA committee or call those members, explain to them how important it is that this bill receive funding and be or be put into the next state budget so that you know this great idea can come to fruition and lake associations communities have a chance to receive matching funds to help their efforts to clean up their lakes. Um, so with that, if you have any questions on how to do that, um, shoot me an email. Um, everybody up here has my email. You can look me up, Google me right online. Uh, email will pop up there. And, you know, it's especially helpful if one of these members is in your district. Uh, and the other piece is write to your uh, legislator, whether your senator, your representative, wherever you are, what district that is, and tell them how important some of these bills are. And you know, tell them why, because you know, the more contact we get from our kid constituents, it really does make a difference. And we definitely think about that bill if it comes to the floor. Um, and so, with that, I'll ask you know, does anybody have any questions right off the bat before I continue? Present number LD 164. 
the, the time is not regarding the funding of lake water quality restoration and protection projects. And unlike all of the bills that you've been discussing before, this one has already passed. It's already succeeded. It's gone through. They said it's a great idea. Let's do it. It was uh, totally unanimous bipartisan support. It just needs the funding. Um, and that's what we're looking for here. Yeah, in the back. Who would you like us to write? So if you go on the legislat legislature's website, you can go to committees. If you select the appropriations committee, all of those members are the ones who will have a vote on what stuff gets funded at the end of the year. And um, it would be important to let them know that this is a priority for funding and that we would like to have that committee recommendation to have this either funded through the money that's on the appropriations table or we put it to a budget. Um, you know, it, it's possible that it could be part of uh, the supplemental budget that, that we pass as well. Um, but yeah, and so that's that's the final piece. You know, so anything that requires funding, it's going to be passed. With um, you know, so that's what we're working on 164 at this point is trying to find that money. And it's uh, possible that it could come through a supplemental budget and you know, we're, we're working on, on that as well. Um, do we have any other? No, I just want to share, uh, Maine Lakes does uh, have an have an advocacy alert, legislative alert system. And so I, by email and just it's lakes.me slash advocacy. You can sign up. We'll definitely be doing an alert about 164. We'll be doing alerts about the e grade and but some the other bill that you're here will hear about tax talking about uh, if you want updates, especially calls for actions with specific directions on where to go, what to do, uh, just check out that website. Left. Yeah, that's super helpful. And pay attention to those emails when they come, because it, 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 like I said, it does help to hear from our constituents and, and what matters to them. Is there another? Yeah, so I have one. Yeah. Oh, lakes.me. Is the main link's website slash advocacy. When does the clock run out on this session? Are these some of these bills that haven't gone past committee yet? Are they going to die on the table and we have to look at a fixture? What's yeah. the time frame? So the, the time frame is anything that's on the appropriations table lasts until the second session. So uh, it would be October, it would be essentially in probably sometime in April of next year. So it, right, so right now we're in the first session. We're in the first regular session. We're in the first special session, essentially the first regular session right now. And then go back and do our second regular session. Anything that's passed and is on the table, we carry it over. And then when we adjourn finally, when the 131st legislature is done, that's when anything that is left on the table unfunded will just will essentially not become law and will go away. I and mean, you have to start the process all over again in the 132nd the next election. So what's that date? The end of the second session is when? It would be around this time next year is okay. when okay. is when we would really have to get everything pulled off that table. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. Okay. And so with that, I'll go on to a few of the other bills. Uh, there is LD 306, which is just a placeholder bill that's in front of the ENR committee. It's kind of there in case there's some great idea that pops up that we need to address uh, because the way the legislature is set up, if you want to put a bill in and have an idea, you have to do it back in November. So any bill that hasn't yet come through, unless you get emergency approval, um, is all the bills listed are the bills there. And so this bill is just there in case there's some great idea that was overlooked, the uh, ENR committee can then implement something. Um, there's another bill, uh, 649, which just deals with um, the, the, an act to promote water conservation and water quality, great habitat for wildlife, including pollinator species by protecting low in, impact landscaping, which as you can imagine, this. You know, in addition to helping, you know, bees and butterflies and everything like that, it also would help, you know, point source pollution and um, reduce runoff into uh, the surrounding water bodies. And then we have 693, uh, an act to protect in the water quality shore limit 
uh, wildlife and oh, that's one uh, from the wake boat. It's a wake boat that you just heard. Uh, that one is interesting uh, procedurally because it got a divided report out of the committee, which means that some of the committee members, I think it was four committee members, voted that that bill should pass. There are some slight amendments to it, uh, but they wanted to pass that bill. And the rest of the committee essentially chose to go with 379, which is to study the issue. Uh, and 379 is not necessarily a bad alternative. Uh, it just doesn't become law. And then, you know, it can be studied and then you have to assess next year and go through this entire process again with the same concerns and whether the committee that changes its mind to say, yes, we do want to regulate these folks or not is for debate. Um, but going back to 693, because there was four members of the committee that voted that it should pass, it's going to go in front of the entire legislature, both the House and the Senate. And we'll be able to vote for it on the floor, you know, to determine whether it should pass, uh, whether it should be amended a little bit, or whether we should go with the majority not pass that bill just with the study. That's also where your advocacy can help out. If you, you know, if you feel that it's very important to enact the wake bill now, which with a caveat being that that law would not go into effect until September. Because any bill that's that's passed only gets enacted you know, 90 days after session ends, unless there's an emergency. To get an emergency, you need two thirds of the House and the Senate, which it's very unlikely to get. So, for all intents and purposes, that bill would not be effective this year uh, until uh, late September, early October. Um, but that's another one that might be coming floor that. that We'll have some discussions there, and at bare minimum, it will have debate in front of the whole legislature so that we know when the study bill comes back that there's some significant uh, movement on that. Davis, when might that happen? When might it come before the uh, A few weeks, probably, is my guess. It, it's going to have to go through an amendment process, a uh, review process, some other some other stuff. But the legislative session, in theory, is supposed to end uh, in June. So we don't have a ton of time to get everything done. And so it, it could happen pretty quick. But I'm sure that that will be part of the acts alert for all of you. Um, yeah. And then we have um, LD10 that was passed, was basically just a department built to clean up what it means to be an invasive species to, to include a few species that were not currently on the list so that um, you know those damaging species are all considered invasive, whether they're native or, or not. Um, my favorite was it, it added swollen bladder wart, which does not sound like a fun thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then there's also a bill. Uh, I know I heard um, Francis talking earlier about you know uh, invasive species. There's a bill to require that a fish ladder um, put on a particular. I'm not sure exactly which uh, northern Piscataquis River um, to basically try to keep the pike from going off that river. Um, I can speak more about that if anybody has interest in that. And then there's also uh, a bill to increase the fees for the uh, lake protection sticker fees. One of them is kind of a $2 annual fee, so it would go up by 10 initially and then two thereafter. Uh, the committee, the IFW committee is actually hearing that bill on Monday uh, to determine what to do with the increased fees. Um, and of course, the committee can do whatever it wants. So if, if the bill may propose a $10 fee now with $2 thereafter. The committee could say, you know, let's just index it to inflation and tie it with, with that formula. Um, not sure where that's going to head, but the public hearing for that is uh, coming up on Monday. Um, and there's a, a few other ones as well, um, but you know I'd like to also field some more questions there and um, see your thoughts. I know um, we can certainly get heavily debating many things, um, and I know the Clean Drain Dry Bill is a bill that has been 
uh, perpetually in front of the legislature, and it just hasn't gained the traction that many people have hoped, um, primarily for the reasons that uh, Francis eloquently articulated. Um, and I know this iteration, the public hearing has already happened uh, back in February. The work session is yet to happen. I think everybody's trying to work through those issues to see if there's a way we can figure out you know, how to effectively enforce it. And um, you know, another concern is we don't want people showing up on a boat launch saying, oh, Maine law says I need to drain my boat. Now I'm here on the launch and I'm not draining the water, but it's still flowing right into the water. So there needs to be uh, some you know, contingency for what happens when a boat shows up at a launch, reads a sign, understands that, you know, this is against the law. And there needs to be some place at every launch where they can effectively drain their boat and it's not actually just going to uh, get into the water as the lake um, drains it into the water. Yeah. And so I know I've been rambling, but that's what legislators are good at. Right? <laughs> and, 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 you know, we don't do PowerPoints, we just, you know, orate. <laughs> but, you know, really, I just wanted to be a resource for you to ask questions today. Yeah. So, not so much a question, but I just want to. See, this is the gallows point that, um, yes, I can understand the concerns about trying to enforce a law, but I think it's important that the law is on the books because it does give those of us that are on the front lines at the boat launch, you know, monitoring a closed boat launch where people continue to go into it, that we can say this is against the law um, and that all the work service have reported. I understand that, that there's short staffing, but we don't abolish uh, speed limit signs because there's not enough police to enforce it. So I think we need to put the law into effect so that the, the general community and the, and the public can say this is against the law. And, and I think that's a great point. That was, um, and I think you need to respond. Yeah. Um, so that produces <laughs> and, and I think that um, you don't need to make that point to me. Because I, um, I'm a lawyer, and, you know, I'm not a legally a lawyer, and lawyers like laws. So I said, not, you know, the law says you can't do that, you can't do that. Very cut and dry. Whether or not it's enforced, I think, is a different issue. I think that's an important point to make uh, to your representatives, your senators, is that though this may not be an enforced law, as you know, we have a tremendous amount of laws that are not enforced. Um, you know, we could we could go through the criminal um, silicon and just name any number of them. What this is is the tool to one allow signage to say that it is state law, allow courtesy vote inspectors to explain to voters that it is state law. Just the fact that the legislature and the executive branch has said that this is something so important that we want to codify it in law uh, sends a message. It sends a message to you know, manners. It sends a message to people to the media. This is something really important to our state. We take it seriously, um, and I think that that message goes a long way. Um, and and I certainly advocate that. Um, and I think just help relaying that to you know to members of the legislature that even though there are concerns about enforcement, the law in and of itself sends a message that is something that we care about and that we need to implement. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for that comment. Yeah. Great. Uh, so 693 is on the campaign. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's um, 164 that's on the appropriation table. So in your office, why up with two on the appropriations committee? Uh, are percent, uh, can we but do I take the time here? Um, so, so that's a very challenging question because um, we're not, you know, at this stage, we're not debating whether it's a good idea or bad because the legislature said, yes, it's a good idea. We like it. We, we would like to fund this program. Now it's determining, well, are we going to fund, are we going to use money to fund a child tax credit? Are we going to use money to fund housing? Are we going to use money to add a new position to FFW. Um, and it's a competing, you know, it's competing with every other thing in state government that is is using funds. So it's in the budget. So yeah, so it's in the budget committee now. And and so it's not necessarily you know, these people would support these people, but it's 
you know, how do you flag it for them to know that this should be something that's a concern and a priority? Um, you know, and also you can reach out to members of the Environment and Natural Resource Committee to ask them to, in their message to the budget committee, to say, like, make sure the budget committee knows that this is a priority, which, once again, their priorities may be dealing with PFAS cleanup or, um, you know, other really important issues. So it's hard. It's, it's always finding that my balance, but we have a good, well reported bill out um, that will give, in the grand scheme of things, a very small amount of money when you're talking about Billion dollar budget to to like right. the budget committee is is where you want to is where you want to uh, start your efforts at this particular time. Yes, I saw another hand. You need to be. Oh, sorry, sorry. Don't be Yeah, um, yeah. If you have any other questions, just chat with me up back. I mean, I'm happy to help, and I'll also get like get in contact with Commissioner Thank you. Um, so my name is Mary Jewett. I work for the Lakes Environmental Association, many, many, many of you. And I'm kind of going to introduce the panel a little bit. As um, many of you know, there are different parts to the uh, the fight here. So I'm talking about kind of introducing a, a four-legged stool, and you may notice that there's only three on there. <laughs> um, but I'll get to we'll get to the board, it'll be quick. Um, but the four-legged stool are the, the three legs are things that people in the this room are familiar with. And it's gonna be really so we've got prevention, which we talked about, um like prevention, which we've talked some about, and then our plant control groups. So I'm gonna go through each one of these kind of legs because they are really all vitally important to this fight that we're that we're doing right now. So prevention, um, as a lot of people in this room know, we've had a courtesy well inspection program for about 22, 23 years. This was started in 2000 when we first passed our main mill foil law and we said, hey, we need to get on top of this uh, and prevent these plants from getting here uh, before before we have a problem. So as you can see, we have increased a lot over the years. And over, over time, when we uh, we started a grant program, so the Department of Environmental Protection gives out grants to do courtesy boat inspections. And every year we get more and more groups coming on board, more and more people on lakes saying, hey, we should get, we should get into that too. So um, every year we get more, uh, mostly more inspections, and then the that big one, that hundred of two thousand, that was twenty twenty. So we had um, a lot of boats on our lakes in twenty twenty. So that's why that that number is a little bit high. But we do have several groups coming on board this year, and we're looking forward to um, getting some some more numbers up there. So this is this is Jim Fitzgerald. He's not. I thought he was supposed to be here. I don't see him. Um, we have had inspectors doing this for decades. So we've got people on board that have been doing this for a long time. So Jim is somebody on Little Sebago Lake that has been um, a CBI for many, many years. And then we've got young people on board. Uh, those of you that are doing the inspection programs, you know that it can be really hard to find people to do the inspections. But we do um, we do have a pretty good mix across the age spectrum of people doing this job, uh, and they are inspecting boats, but also educating the public. So this is some voters. This is this is the experience they have, and how they get information about invasive species is through our courtesy boats. Um, and then really quick, these are just notable saves saves um, in, in quotations. So we count a save as any time an invasive plant has been removed from a boat, either leaving a lake or going into a lake. And we've had hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of this over the years. And these are just some of the notable ones um, since the beginning of the program. And I will bring your attention to 2018 um, on Penasawasi Lake in Norway, um, there was South here. Um, there was Eurasian Moonfall about a boat coming from Connecticut, Saint Lawrence River, 
And so they found the Eurasian was a lot. She could get off of the trailer. Okay, it was fine. And then um, sent it to the TP Department of Environmental Protection, for identification. And they actually found a zebra mussel growing on the plant. So um, in 2018, we said, oh, oh, it's more than just plants, right? Okay, we really got to start paying attention to this. So this is perfect timing to have you over. Uh, second leg is early detection. So this is just a little uh, blurb. Many of you probably already know about this. In 2009, Petrilla was discovered in Damascona Lake, and it was discovered by a volunteer who had gone through um, a plant identification class. They were out there, found it in the little cove. We stopped it really early, treated it with herbicides, and now Damascona Lake is not filled with Petrilla because of that early detection. And we do have folks here from the Lake Stewards of Maine. Many of you know they have been doing these plant treatings for years and years, educating volunteers about what these plants look like so that we can go out on the lakes and find them really. And here's just a, an image of people out in kayaks looking for plants. And then the last one is plant control. And I really hope that it continues to just be plant control and not invasive aquatic species control, right? Um, because as we know now, once we get these invasive animals in there, it's a whole different ballgame. So hopefully we uh, continue to just have to do this plant control. So this is a crew um, removing milfoil from a river. And then we've got the tiger. We have like a similar strategies, um, some invasive species from size, a lot we do just manual removal, where we get into the water, pull up these plants, um, and and just take them out of the water. But something that I'm continually saying is it's not just milfoil. Of course, these these two slides are of people controlling milfoil. We do have um, seven different invasive aquatic plants in our lakes in Maine. Milfoil is the most common, but it's not the only one. Um, so we do have European naiad, curly leaf pondweed. Parrot feather, drilla, European frog's bit, and three different milfoil species. So um, it's not just milfoil. That's why many of you that have been doing this for years, uh, this used to be called the milfoil summit. And we just recently changed it to, to try and um, remind people that it's not just milfoil. So the fifth leg. And it's such good timing. And I, we did not talk about this before. And it's panic. <laughs> I swear, like, I did not know that was going to be part of your presentation. Um, and, and then I can actually change it to motivation to be a bit more positive. Um, we, as these stories come up, as we learn about new things, there is a certain amount of urgency um, that, that we all feel. And it, Panic is not awesome, but it is good to be realistic. Like once we discover and we learn more information about this, we need to take action and be proactive. In the state of Maine, we have been, I don't even want to call it luck because we just have a lot of really dedicated people that want to be proactive and preventative. Hurts was luck. Hurts <laughs> was luck. Um, so, yeah, so getting on top of it, but I do have a couple of <laughs> motivation. Um, just a couple from out of state, um, other states dealing with these issues. Um, and, you know, we read the headlines, it's choking, it's a dangerous invasive species, choking some more. Um, and then this is, a lot of people may recognize this guy. Um, this is Peter Lowell, who was our former executive director at LEA. And in the late 1990s, um, there was a group of concerned, concerned citizens that got together and said, hey, you know, we're seeing this problem in other states. Like, let's get on it before it happens here. And um, so that's what we did. And then I have... I have a fifth leg. There's actually 10 legs, so get comfortable. No, just kidding. But there, there is a fifth leg that I thought of this morning, which is dedication. So I know that many people in this room, it's been decades that they've been in this fight and they're still fighting. And it's really admirable 
to, to see all of these faces year after year after year. They care so much about our lakes and ponds. So thank you to the people that have been doing this for so long and the new folks getting on board for the next two decades. So this was a good um, good setup for the panel. We do have some agenda, so we don't have any of the days. So here we are. Here we are. So um, we do have folks coming up that are kind of experts in the, the three legs of the stool, although maybe our partners from New Brunswick can come up for the panic leg. <laughs> Just kidding, we don't have time for that. Um, so we've got um, Francis and Chris and myself uh, up here for prevention. We've got Lucy Lee. Um, and Megan and Kristen and it's Christine from LSM are here for early detection. And then for control work, we've got Denise, which uh, um, shared man from Seven Links and Cliff from, from New England Milk Oil. So we're going to be up here. Oh, so John. Sorry, John. That's okay. I'm a moderator. Great to see many of you who are seeing her tour here and see the faces. I don't think we'll just. Oh, you need a spot there. I suggest that uh, if need be, we can start to go through and ask people to uh, provide comments. But let's see what we have for questions of this pen. Again, yes. Or I can bring the mic to you. I can bring the mic to you. Uh, do anybody have a question to start the panel? Here we go. I'm giving you a mic if you want. We're talking about transporting invasive species, whether they be plant or mussels, whatever. There are some bodies of water south of us that you have to have your boat pretty much sanitized before it's allowed to go in. Why couldn't the state of Maine ask that anything coming in from outside the state go through the same process where it is sanitized and then it is certified? And what they do is they put a lock or a band right on the uh, trailer that certifies it was done. And once that seal is broken, then it has to be redone. Anybody? Anybody? Any question? I'll take a shot at it, John. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so I'm Denise Lynchett, Maine Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and I'm just going to take a broad shot at that question because it's really um, pretty complicated. But first off, some of those areas that you're talking about, that kind of lock an access point for inspect before going in. They're in the west or they're from some other place where main access to lakes is, is pretty broad. And as many of you know, there's multiple access to lakes. There's multiple ways to get into Maine. So it would be really hard to find a central point where every boat coming into Maine would go through that point. It, it would be logistically very, very difficult. So I think I think it, in the best of the world, there, there would be a great solution and an easy one. But I think for our type of state borders, the way that things work, for instance, in Canada, you can actually go from Canada to Maine without ever crossing. So it just logistically probably would be difficult to pull off in Maine. Any other comments from the panel? Francis? So from our agency standpoint, um, I'm more concerned about what's to the south than what's here um, and now to the north <laughs> a little bit too um i think the agencies really do need to think about strategies you know, to manage those i mean we have a huge uh, number of individuals and, and families that, that vacation in this state 
there's a huge influx of boating traffic that's coming in from places that's got a lot more than we already got. We do need to figure out some kind of a strategy. I don't know what it'll look like, but but it's something we really need to commit some time and attention to thinking about how we can get increased awareness and increased um, uh, comfort level with all those boats that are traveling from places where, again, there's other things out there that we definitely don't want to see here. So um, I, I appreciate where you're at. And, and again, I, I express the same concerns and it's something that I think the agencies do need to work on. Do you uh, follow up and then we'll go to Gary. Do you have a follow up to that? No, in the back? Yes, thank you. You've already you had scales the entrances on the major highways. And most of the people coming in are coming in on the major highways. Right? You're going to have somebody that's going to skirt it. But if we just had a basic process, what I'm referring to is the Quadland Reservoir in central Massachusetts. Any boat that goes in there has to be clean before it can go in. And Quabbin Reservoir is the Boston Water Authority. All right, so they were really trying to protect it. We could do the same thing here. Nothing is going to be bulletproof. There's always going to be a way that's going to, somebody's going to do the pooch. All right, but if we could at least get something to get people to try to do the right thing. And I will just add that in the early years of the Invasive Species Program, we did have inspections advertised at on the turnpike for boats coming in and we received very we had very very few inspections that actually occurred and sometimes uh it, it was if it was it was backed up on the highway people would actually come off the highway to try to get a few cars ahead and get back on higher up the highway but uh sometimes we got some inspections in but the inspections, the cost per inspection at that time was very, very high given the output. I recognize you're talking of a requirement. So we're going to go on to Gary and then Gary, go ahead. We're just saying that we need to look for so many things. And it's not just for late weeds and zebra mussels and all of that. People are bringing firewood in, spreading animal dashboard. There's so many invasive species that are coming in from other parts of the country or from we got emerald ash borer originally from New Brunswick or up, up north. So, uh, that's a much higher level for lots of things. There's something that I've been trying to propose and, and move forward through the, the governor's office. But it, it's, as Tata said, we also have people that are unhoused. We also have so many other competing priorities that we need to work together to come up with ways of funding because without additional funding, you don't get the general fund money to do something like this, to have inspection stations. Florida, California, they have inspection stations for just about everything. They put up big barriers at their at all their borders to stop things from coming in, but they've got big resources. Lots of people that are doing that. It takes a gigantic effort to do something like that. So there has to be a lot of support for it, and there has to be a new way to fund it, because you're not going to get that out of the general fund. Guarantee that. Thanks, Gary. Before we go on to the next person, I just want to make sure, I don't think I did this, maybe you were starting to do this, Mary, but to make sure people understand what we have for background here in prevention. Francis, we have you under prevention. Chris Riley, you already heard from, you heard from Francis earlier. You heard from Mary, you heard from our colleagues from New Brunswick. Thank you again very much for coming here. And Christine is with the Lake Stewards of Maine. Lucy Leaf is a top notch A1 super uh, plant patrolman. And there's some others in the, in the audience here also in recognizing. And you, Denise answered a question working with us. Sharon Van has a great deal of experience in the land. Doing and planning for movement, not to mention organizing boat inspections. And then Cliff Cabrani, many of you may have known of Cliff and his business doing the milfoil that does a lot of removal work. So just so you know what we have up here, if you have any specific questions, I think it was one here, and I'll come to you, Donnie. Two quick questions for Chris. Is your PowerPoint a little more to it's been a 
We'll add it to the training resources page on our website. Um, so, okay. Another question is, um, has anything ever been done to figure out what it costs to do a currency bond inspection? You know, looking at the total amount we spent and the number of uh, nice species we have, right? the number of any type of species. Chris's, Chris's PowerPoint will be on the late uh, LEA website. Did you want to, do you want to say something about cost? Uh, so Larry, yeah, we do, um, we do have, I guess I would call them rough numbers. Um, as you know, the groups that do courtesy boat inspections that get those grant, the grant money have to submit a final report and that will detail how much they spend on boat inspections what kind of volunteer went, time went into it and what kind of resources were used, including how much you're paying your, your boat inspectors. So we do have those numbers and we do have numbers of how many saves we've had over the years. Uh, it's a big database. So, um, but we put those numbers together because everybody, anybody that works for a nonprofit in here for sure knows that um, we're putting a lot of resources the nonprofits are putting in a lot of resources to these programs, these protection programs, and um, it's we need more. <laughs> we need more support uh, to to keep these programs strong. So, thank you, Don. You have a question? Yeah, Chris. I, I loved your PowerPoint. I think it's very informative for everybody. But one thing you didn't specify is you saw a peak in. Uh, right in, in September. Yes. And I want to make everybody, a, you know, what I think is aware, should be aware of the reason for that is basically most of those plants are billful, driven, and that's when the plant becomes older, so it's closer to the surface and a lot more brittle. So it's a lot more uh, fragments. So I think that's why we need to really focus on September. That is a really good point. And um, I'm sorry. Thank you, Doug. Uh, that, that is a really good point. And um, it, it's also a reason, uh, interestingly enough, for why I actually didn't do as much on the entire data set. You saw the number of invasives were all over the place early on. And uh, one of the many charts that got cut for the final uh, presentation was one that showed why I did not use the entire data set based on fragments found uh, in 2005, not to but Ms. Zelensky showed 90 fragments in October. And what it turns out to be that that just threw everything off in terms of being able to make any sort of conclusions moving forward. And it, upon further examination, it was late in the season, a lot of fragmentation, exactly like what Donnie was saying, at a launch where, if I remember correctly, the wind kind of blew everything in anyway. So, of course, it was going to, you would have to, you know, go through a minefield to get to the launch. And so that's where that gigantic data skewing, but valid number came from. And it's exactly what Donnie's talking about with the uh, uh, fragmentation starting in the later season. And one more thing on that was, kind of on Google Hang on, Donnie. I'm happy to bring you back, bring you back to you. Has anybody ever thought of, because the, the number of uh, invested pawns in the safe name, uh, like my pond, really, we never had a courtesy boat inspection, but we've had no more for years. Uh, make it as mandatory where you have CPIs at invested pond and you don't support the non invested because if you only have to worry about the 30 ponds in the state of Maine being inspected, then you don't have to worry about ones that's not inspected because. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I don't need to see everybody's hand and shut them down. Um, just a really quick thing. I, I agree that doing inspections on infested water bodies is, is obviously very, very important. Um, however, and I've said this before, that list of infested water bodies, that's documented infestations. So we don't know. Um, a lot of the places that are uninfested uh, might have invasive plants, and we don't know. So, and we have had cases where a boat inspector inspected a boat coming out of an uninfested lake 
and they found milk oil. So it, it is important for, um, for us to continue to do that. And a lot of these lakes, you've got boats coming from out of state, right? So we're inspecting boats going into a lake and coming out of a lake every single time uh, because those uninfested lakes, it, all it takes is one. But I agree that we should be, any, any lake, any infested lake with a public boat launch should have inspections. Um, so how many of them don't have inspections? So I don't have the number of infested lakes right off the top of my head that don't have um, that have inspections, but I can figure that out. But a lot do. And we are trying to increase that, that number. Just so you, if you folks know, we have the state DP has, has a grant program for boat inspections. And there's a competitive portion of it that is for uninfested lakes. There's a competitive process for awarding grants. But for the infested lakes, we have what we call a dedicated or direct fund where we, based on the information we get from inspections in past years or what we perceive or what we judge to be the risk of spread from that water body, we set aside funding for the infested lakes. And uh, that, that's a whole range from a few thousand dollars up to $12,000. $12, yes, I think you had your hand up, Oil. September and October apparently is a very high risk for the entrapment of bees in boats and tanks. How about uh, commercial? Uh, saying and using the nets, these uh, these bait trappers come from lake to lake. They use their own nets. Uh, there's no actual requirement to inspect those nets. Uh, the possibility that they may pick up bees in, in Arrowhead, for example, that has high uh, no oil, and then carry it to other lakes without inspection. Is there? Any initiative, maybe any concern uh, amongst your folks about that issue or, and how to deal with it? So our, our department does regulate commercial harvest. Uh, commercial harvesters that are targeting bait fish do need to have um, a, uh, a license from us. Um, we we also maintain lists of waters that are open to commercial harvest and those that are closed, as well as those that are partially restricted. And we also uh, allow different gear types depending on the level of risk. So for example, waters where we have known infestations or portions of waters where there are established uh, uh, infestations, we close those to the use of sinks. Um, but we do allow the use of bait traps, which are a more rigid structure that are much more easily cleaned and managed that same. So we have taken some steps to address that issue. Certainly on waters where we don't have infestations, mm -hmm. um, harvesters can go in there, at least the ones that are open, can use um, sweep stain nets to, to harvest from. We also provide, as part of that licensing process, while it's not a requirement, we do provide best management practices and how to manage those nets in a responsible way that reduces the risk of removing AIS or really anything uh, from water to water. It is in the interest of the industry for them to, to, to utilize these practices because the reality is when new fish are introduced to a new water body that they like to fish, they find that their bait catch drops. Um, they also find that they can't use their nets if, if, if because right now the way we manage um, our, our commercial harvesters, if there's infestations, you can no longer use your preferred method of harvest, which is the same. So there is a built-in incentive for people in the industry to do the right thing. Um, and I do think there are some other steps moving forward, especially when we have our new AIS coordinator on board, that will try to be a little bit more proactive in uh, trying to move the needle a little bit more. Uh, it is an issue we're keenly aware of, and we are, like in many areas within my world, we are working to move the needle and make some progress. That's definitely one area as well. 
follow up to that and for anybody here too. Um, we, uh, I mean, we're here today talking about zebra mussels, but we've also been dealing with the detection of Eurasian one milfoil since 2015. Meg was the person who found it. Um, and uh, a, a couple of groups are looking at the notion of closing off various areas that are known to be infested. And I was wondering if there are any regulations in place in the state of Maine that allow for that, or if there are any groups out there who to indicate on their waterways voluntary areas that you reduce, that you restrict access to for boaters to produce going in and picking it up, but also chopping it up, creating more uh, fragments. So uh, I think John may want to talk on this too, but so as I as I just mentioned, we, we do have some areas that will be identified in the application on waters mm -hmm. where there were infestations, where there are ongoing efforts to remediate. Um, and particularly if it's in conjunction with service use restriction, which is something John can talk a bit more about. But what about recreation being? So those are designated, they're identified, and um, there is um, working on trying to improve the way we create the awareness, but there are things that, that are out there and some of those have messaging on them. Um, so there are steps to, to keep people out of maybe more sensitive areas, particularly those that are, that are subject to some ongoing remediation. But, there is, excuse me, there is statute in Maine that allows for an order issued by the commissioners of Fish and Wildlife and DEP. It has to be a joint order that both commissioners agree to, to restrict access to a portion of a water body for a specific duration. And typically, the, that duration is, is a portion of a year. The, the, there are two active service use restrictions in the state right now and a third pending and that would come until the end of the calendar year and then be re potentially reconsidered the following year and that would that would allow uh, that would allow the departments if needed to access for surveying or organizations that are informing our management lake associations they have permission to enter those areas Sharon, you had something you were going to say. Um, this was a question about the cities. How how fast of a turnaround is there in notifying and prohibiting people from bait fishing in infested water bodies? Just as an example, so I'm in the Belfry Lakes watershed, and we have two infestations um, that were both. Um, we were pretty sure both started in a very secluded stream. So one in Great Meadow Stream and the other one in the Serpentine, both of them are miles away from a public boat launch. But there are a number of hand paddle launches along those that are active launch sites for duck hunters and also bait singers. Um, so how fast is the turnaround for IMW notifying these bait singers to not go back here? So we, we start issuing our licenses uh, for commercial harvest in December of each year. We start that process, or we actually lay out um, and identify waters or portions of waters that can be fished with various gear types. We work with John McFedrin to understand where there are areas of concern, and that informs the process at that point in time. So it's not it's not as responsive as what you might like to see. And part of that is licenses, and it's it's a little bit difficult to to we can follow up and say, hey, by the way, we've got a new infestation here. But the reality is, we tie that to an annual cycle of coordination. That's how it's currently managed. Yeah. 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 Um, so hypothetically, there could be an announcement made about prohibiting bait fishing and other activities in infested areas as they come up, similar to how the surface use restrictions are announced. Because surface use restrictions aren't just announced, you know, at the beginning of the calendar year. They're announced when they get approved or by full commissioners. Are you are you saying if there's discovery partly through a year, you're saying could it could that area be then close to saying from that point on? Yes. 
Um, in, the in theory, yes, in theory, you know, we could, we, and we know, and it's really important, one of the reasons that we regulate commercial harvesters is so we can contact them and we can work on them on the various issues that, that are in play, including AIS prevention and management. So in theory, we could do that. We have not been doing that. Um, but we, that's certainly a procedural kind of thing that, that John and I can talk about. But it, it would be good if, if it was tied to some some kind of a determination, like how significant or serious a, a, of an infestation is there. And then we have a lot of waters because we do collect information on where people are harvesting. A lot of waters aren't even harvested. You know, so you, you may be concerned that there could be a harvester there, but the reality is it's not a water that's even commercially harvested. So there's some things to think about there. Um, but again, I think that's another area John and I can certainly explore a little bit further um, if, if there's a feeling that we're not being responsive enough. There was one question in the back a while ago. You, um, do you, do you need a microphone? Come in. Sorry, now I have three questions, but um, I you don't have to answer all of them. So maybe one question is uh, to maybe the Canadian folks. Uh, did, did I hear you right that um, you're using dogs for detection in some places? And if that's the case, is that something you would recommend being done at the border? And then another question I have is, does anyone give, want to give an update on Chinese mystery snails in the state? Or is that something we're not um, up to reporting on right now? And the other question I have is just about, um, do we need to promote a bill related to R&D for, for how to kill things in um, ballast water in freshwater lakes uh, and specifically in wake boats? I'm sorry. So uh, we are not currently using detection dogs anywhere in New Brunswick, um, but it is something I would love to have because they do use them in Alberta and British Columbia and various other uh, U.S. states, and they have been proven to be effective. So um, I believe there was 12 interceptions at inspection stations going into B.C. that caught zebra mussels that were not detected by inspectors, like we're talking trained professional inspectors that were caught by the dogs at those stations. So they prevented 12 interceptions of lake or boats infested heading for BC waters. So they do work, they are expensive. Um, I've been told by Minnesota that the cost of one detection dog is about more than the rest of all of their efforts combined. Um, but they are, they are very effective and they're used for other invasive species too. Um, uh, it's one of those things where I'm always throwing it out as that is something, you know, ideally that we would have. And if anybody has the capacity to do so, definitely uh, encourage that. On the Chinese mystery sale, I don't know what's going on in Maine, but I do know that we also have those in New Brunswick. Nothing much is really being done. There's a couple lakes that, um, a couple of areas that are infested with Chinese mystery sale. Um, but it is not one that is currently um, high on our priority list. I can speak for you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Chinese mystery snail in Maine. At this point in time, uh, we are tracking it. There is a there should be a map available on Lakes of Maine, um, and which is our data portal. Uh, and we are tracking where those are being reported. Um, and they do travel in the same way as zebra mussels. They have a villager stage. It is free floating in the water, and that is how they're getting around. It's Microscopic, it's visible, it's traveling around in ballast water, um, and it's you know difficult to to detect in any sort of visual inspection. Um, there are uh, mitigations that are taking place on lakes where that is happening. As far as prevention efforts, it's just very difficult to do. Uh, mitigation strategies tend to involve uh, large um, volunteer groups going out. Um, there's lakes that do Chinese mystery snail derbies. There are prizes for the most mystery snails collected. Um, that's one way of handling it. Unfortunately, there's not, as far as I've found, not a, a significant amount of research on what effects they're having in our lakes. Um, we just don't, we don't really know. And, um, and that's kind of what the situation is at right now. I can try to answer the question about wakes. Um, I think 
uh, the Maine Voting Impacts Coalition, which has representatives from a lot of the organizations in this room. Um, I think we're going to look to address that hopefully in the legislature, maybe next year. Um, so thanks, Lauren. You had uh, before I go to you. Do you still have a question? Comment on pulling off part of the lake that has a milk oil infestation. So it's just related to that. Um, so Lake Auburn is just the next town over. And I was just going to say in the northern shallow end of it, we do have a milk oil infestation. So we do booty that off to any motorized boating activity. Um, there still is uh, an area that we put in to use in kayaks, but we do just limit that access. Um, and that's a helpful for us. Thank you, Ed. Just before we go to the remainder here, we go to at noon, and which is a little bit over. And Mary is going to start the training for CBI at twelve fifteen. So I realize it's a jam-packed quick turnaround, but that's the plan. Yes. Yes. Uh, would somebody like to comment on the efficacy? and the safety of chemical treatment for plants. Yeah. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> the Department of Environmental Protection does use herbicides in certain instances where we feel that the risk of using that herbicide is warranted. We don't take that decision lightly. We any product that we use or propose to use is registered by the EPA. Each registration process, and Gary's leaving the room right now, he knows this well better than I am. Each, each registration process uh, examines the risks of that herbicide on, on mammals, on birds, on various uh, organisms, on um, microorganisms, macroorganisms, and so all of that is part of the puzzle deciding whether to apply an herbicide. It's, it, we could talk on about it for quite a while, but we, we do propose it in certain instances, and we, uh, we have a general permit. The state has a general permit for applying herbicide. The general permit has a process of review and a public comment process, and all landowners who are in the water that abuts an herbicide treatment, uh, are following property that abuts an herbicide treatment, are notified of the process. Every, every anything that we put into the water has some level of risk. And you know, I, I'll never uh, talk by so many years ago. We never talk about oh, that product is safe. We don't do that. Every product has some level of risk, and on the label are restrictions for use of that product. So those label restrictions are followed in any project we do. We need to do pretreatment survey of. The area we're going to treat, for, and we need to, in some way, we have various, op, we have several options in our permit. We need to identify the plants that are in that area before treatment, including the target plant, the one we're trying to kill. And we need to monitor after treatment to see if we kill that plant, but also to see what the effects were on the native plants. We need to make observations when we're on site during the treatment. Do we see anything? Do we see fish kills? We need to report those if we see them. There are many layers to it. So that- Do we have any efficacy yeah. studies? Do we know how effective it is here to been done long enough to get a picture? We have some, we have a study of Pickerel Pond. One of the studies that we have is Pickerel Pond Limerick, where we took a, a bold move and decided to try to eradicate hydrilla. And we haven't seen hydrilla in quite a number of years now. We're a little surprised by that, frankly, because we thought we didn't think we'd be able to do that. But part of that process was a post-treatment plant survey that Denise and I did that looked at the rebound of native plants in that system. And 
I'd be glad to talk to you more about that online, uh, offline. But in short, all of the species that were there pre-treatment were there post-treatment. Some species actually responded very well. Others were clearly impacted by the treatment and were not as abundant previously. Sharon. Um, so we had an herbicide treatment on our large infestation in Great Meadow Stream, Great Pond, uh, last year um, with coordination with DEP. And part of um, our process for as an organization, a conservation organization, was to do a very extensive literature review to make sure that this was something that was right for us. Um, it was, you know, safe for us. Um, so I do have um, a pretty good uh, file you know, just filled with all kinds of peer-reviewed literature studies on the efficacy and also the safety um, and regulations on this. And I'd be happy to share that with people, but the most valuable resource was the paper um, in summary that John referenced talking about the EPA, uh, where they, they tested water fleas, uh, the, the effect on water fleas, benthic invertebrates, uh, dogs, ducks, humans, like everything. Uh, so that is a good go-to resource. And from what I remember from that study was the only effects that were observed was over the actual acceptable dosage. So they, they did more than what would ever actually be put into a water body. And that's when things started having some effects. But a group that was most greatly impacted was benthic invertebrates. Everything else within the acceptable standard of application didn't have any effects, any acute or long term effects. So, to be clear, last thing, uh, so basically, we have two studies, both in pretty short term. You know. No, no we, 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 have, we, have, we have six products in our permit, too. We, we should, if you want to talk, it's not because it's much more in depth. Yeah, we, yeah. we have six products in our permit, and when we uh, when we're proposing a project, a product, a chemical to be included in our permit, we write a summary of that product using the literature that Sharon talked about. She was talking about one specific product that was used in Great Meadow Stream. And then we send that to the Board of Pesticides Control, state toxicologists who that, that uh, reviews it and sees it. Yeah, we're, we're on target with it. So I'm glad to talk to you. We're taking one more question. Patricia, last question. So is there any plan, and Denise, I know you've been doing some eDNA stuff with zebra mussels. Um, is there any plan to do a similar risk assessment with like calcium levels and things like that in main lakes and waters? I could talk about mine. Talk about calcium? Just give me, mm -hmm. then you can drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we shared, um, we did a water quality assessment and on lakes, and we have some data on water quality for rivers and streams that we've also shared with in the Fish and Wildlife. So both agencies are kind of looking at that and looking at the water bodies that will be at risk to species that depend on certain water quality parameters. Um, and I will say, so we were actually provided with uh, an analysis. I honestly I don't remember which which organization did it, but I think 2018 there was a similar analysis that looked at zebra mussel uh, suitability of lakes based on calcium in Maine. Uh, so that was one of the things that we took into consideration for ours. Um, but it's one of the things that we are very open with. We're ironing down our process for doing this risk assessment. Um, same thing with our partners in Quebec and more than happy to bring in Maine and Nova Scotia, because if we can kind of coordinate the process of those risk uh, assessments, um, it makes it transferable, right? So we can assess risk, risk at a regional level, knowing that everything is in line with each other um, and make decisions that way. We can get touched to more than. Across, uh, across board collaboration, that's some crazy talk, isn't it? <laughs> really, I'd like to, Give Maggie and Kristen a hand. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for coming. Do you, what's the announcement we have? Would you like to make an announcement to clarify? Um, so 
Those of you that got received grants for the courtesy vote inspection um, from the DEP are required to do a CBI coordinator training with me. So we are going to be starting that at 12.15. That's what is on the agenda. I know it kind of crunches, but it's time to you know, use the restroom. If you got a little snack in your car, you can eat that. If you want to eat some pastries. Um, but I do want to respect people's time. Uh, so I am going to still start right at, right at 12.15 for that coordinator training. Uh, and you cannot pick up your supplies until after the training. There you go. Oh, um, I want to thank uh, the panel, everybody on the panel. Thank you.